Okay, I'd like to call the regular Comox Valley Regional District Board meeting of Tuesday, July 12th to order. Welcome everyone. Before we proceed, I'd like to cover a few basic meeting protocols to ensure our meeting is conducted in an orderly fashion. As your chair, I am mindful that some of the items to be discussed at this meeting may be controversial, and my aim is to ensure that we have a fair, safe, and productive meeting. These meetings are conducted in a manner where only one person, a presenter, a board member, or staff are speaking at any one time. Please use the button on your microphone to indicate your intention to speak. This will put you on the speakers list and I will acknowledge you and turn on your mic when it's your turn. This meeting is not a public hearing, so only those members of the public that have applied to be presenters of the delegation may be permitted to speak. In this regard, comments, shouting, or heckling during the presentation or subsequent deliberations will not be tolerated. Some other safety items in the event of emergency, we have multiple exits on the sides of the rooms and, and uh, also uh, the door that you entered. And the marshalling station is out in the parking lot behind you. And if you need to use washrooms, you go back out into the hallway you entered and they are behind the boardroom. Thank you. So I'd like to acknowledge that we're on the traditional unceded territory of the Comox First Nation. And um, as we move toward reconciliation, we've taken upon ourselves to educate our, ourselves and the public, um, first on the United Nations Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So we chose one article a meeting to read out. Um, and now we are on the calls, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada calls to action. And so we read one call to action um, at the beginning of each meeting. And today, this one is on education. And it says, we call upon the federal government to eliminate the discrepancy in federal education funding for First Nations children being educated on reserve and those First Nation children being educated off reserve. And that takes us to our adoption of minutes from June 28th. Grant and Morin, thank you. Any further discussion of those minutes? All in favor of receipt? Anyone opposed? That's carried, thank you. And we are on to delegations and we have two this evening. The first is Saratoga Motorsports and Noise Bylaw Delegation of Scott Fleming. Move for receipt. Second. Grieve and Grant, thank you. And can we have the delegate come forward? Is Scott Fleming online, I believe? Yes. Yep. Okay. Great. We turn the floor over to you, Scott. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, first off, I, I'd just like to say I'm, I'm not affiliated in any way with uh, Saratoga um, or any of the other um, people here in support today for them. Um, I'm just kind of speaking on my own regard um, in support for Saratoga Speedway and uh, the effect it kind of has on our community. Um, I mean, it's been noted in the past uh, couple meetings with regards to the noise ball law that's, that's been recently passed um, that uh, we, we've kind of looked into what other communities in BC have done, um, you know, to welcome these kind of events uh, within the community. Obviously, they've been a big part of our, our community for a long time. So it's kind of disappointing to see us take this sudden stance of, of putting such a restriction on, on their ability to to operate. Um, for example, uh, in the past, I worked for Toronto Motorsports Park. Um, they're in Ontario, in, in a region similar to the Comox Valley with, with many rural communities that come together. Um, but at the same time, they have that same kind of extended ability to, to operate these big events, not only on a weekly basis, but they're also recognized through special events within the Haldeman County um, to hold larger events, whether they're televised series or events that are going to be going past these bylaw restrictions that are currently in place. So it would be nice to see us recognize some sort of, you know, um, a middle ground where we can not only allow them to operate and, and offer the jobs that are not only created within their own um, business, but the jobs that are going to be created through tourism and people visiting the island for, um, you know, these events, not only on a weekly basis, but maybe these bigger events as well that bring in larger crowds from, from bigger areas. So 
Um, another comparison being Langford and the Western Speedway, they've welcomed that uh, in their community. And, and it, again, it's disappointing to see us all of a sudden take a sudden stance where this is something that's essentially being, in essence, shut down. Um, to be operating on such limited hours, um, from my past experience, it's hard to offer um, these kind of events in that capacity. Um, so, so it would be interesting to find a middle ground that that's good for everybody here. Um, another thing I'd like to touch on um, is actually having some sort of um, audio report. Um, I think it's been mentioned in the past by the council that it's something that it might be a cost issue, um, but at, at the current time, it seems like it's a matter of people's opinion um, on how the noise is affecting who and what levels they're at. Um, it, it doesn't seem like we have much hard data on what's actually going on here in our community, so it would be nice to bring that to the table um, considering what's going on. Um, finally, like, I guess my, my, I want to echo what seems to be put out in the community is that, um, we, we felt kind of taken off guard by how this was passed so quickly. Um, I realized the council has stated in a, a recent report here, uh, dated July 7th, that, I mean, uh, it, it's a matter of, of how that region is able to vote on, you know, their bylaws and what goes on there. But at the same time, I feel that the board didn't really take into consideration um, all of the issues from all sides fairly. Um, and this relates back to the code of conduct that the CVRD has put together. Um, and similar to that, it, it it's also relates to section 17 in the meetings where we have to consider all the relevant facts and opinions from all sides. Um, fairly, which again, it, it seemed like so far it's been a fairly one-sided uh, battle, I guess you could say. Um, but in that, we do have to find a middle ground. It's it's not something that um, I think we should, you know, it, like nobody gets a say on one side or the other. But at the same time, I think there's been a mistake made in the recent amendments to that bylaw. Um, it unfairly impacts Saratoga as a business, um, at least. From, from past experience and how these kind of businesses operate within the community, it, it puts them in a, in a tough spot, at least from my point of view. So um, it, it would be nice to have those considerations kind of put, um, put forward as we move forward looking into this um, as a community. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, are you open to questions from the board? Of course. Great, I think we do have some questions, starting with Director Grief. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you, Scott, for um, having the, the gumption and fortitude to come up and, uh, and, uh, and address us here as a delegation. I'd also like to take the opportunity to uh, thank the gallery for showing up. This shows the width and depth of, uh, of concern in, in the community. I'm going to start by saying that uh, I fully admit that uh, I don't think the CVRD has got this right yet. I think we made a mistake. We kind of broke our own rules um, at the last meeting. I'm, I'm heartened to see that the chair is, is going to be putting this forward uh, to staff to bring back a report later in the month. But um, that being said, I think it's, it's, it's always tough to get a middle ground. We talk about that, you know, and uh, some people will think that, uh, you know, that the, by trying to compromise that you're somehow betraying the cause. In reality, no, we're not. I think that what we're trying to do is to balance the, uh, the operator's uh, right to do business uh, with some of the concerns uh, of the, some of the uh, neighboring residents. It's not easy, but I think we have to do it. And um, I do think that uh, perhaps the concerns of, uh, of this group here have been uh, under, understated, underreported. So I'm very heartened to see them coming forward tonight. I do think that uh, we can arrive at some kind of a, uh, a reasonable solution. I think cooler heads always have to prevail. In fact, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day and I said, it's almost like when you do a survey you have to take the high scoring number off and the lowest scoring numbers off, and then you average what's in between. And I think that's what we fail to do. So I will be supporting the motion coming forward to, uh, to have staff bring a report back on, on how we can work out a compromise that will allow uh, racing to continue in Saratoga. 
But one thing we have to bear in mind uh, is that this is basically a nuisance bylaw, noise bylaw. Nobody's going to send any RCMP. So it's not the bigger question about the operation of the speedway here. I think that discussion will be had at a later date uh, when the owner of the speedway brings forward an application for rezoning. Um, right now, he's uh, pulled that off the table, and with that went the public hearing and all the other uh, public outreaches that we could we could uh, we could use. So we didn't we didn't uh, follow our own staff's advice. Our our staff suggested nine thirty uh, as a, as a quit time, and uh, staff also cautions against doing first, second, third, and final adoption all in the same meeting. So I admit, um, I think that I, I broke my own rules to this as well. And uh, I, I learned a lesson about, about that in the future. So thanks once again, and uh, we'll see how this all plays out. But I'm very confident, knowing the quality of the people that are involved, that we are going to arrive at a, at a conclusion that would be equitable for both parties. Thank you. Madam Chair. I'd just like to clarify a few points, please. And that is that no rules were broken in terms of legislative rules with respect to what came forward. This is a noise bylaw, not a nuisance bylaw. It's in, in, in law, there's, they're quite different and distinct things. Thank you for the clarification. Dr. Hamir. Yeah, thanks to, to staff for, for clarifying that because I was going to speak to that. Um, and thanks to Scott too for, for coming forward and, and presenting. Um, I, I wanted to ask um, staff a few questions about some of the points that Scott brought up. Um, first of all, um, potential for doing an audio report. Um, I'm wondering if staff could comment on um, whether or not we have the equipment to do something like that. Or, and if so, um, if, if that is a possibility. Uh, Madam Chair, I'd like to uh, call on Amanda Yasinski, the manager of bylaw compliance, just to respond to the question. Through the chair, the regional district does not have any equipment or the ability to do such an assessment. Thanks for answering that. Um, Scott, you mentioned, you know, a couple of times um, sudden stance and, and sort of the suddenness of, of the decision making. And I'm wondering if our staff could comment on just the process that we use to arrive at the, the decision. Um, I guess it might've taken a few people off guard, but um, we've been talking about this um, bylaw for quite a few months. So would staff be able to just give maybe a timeline of when we first began speaking about a noise bylaw? Uh, Madam Chair, I'd like to call on Jake Martins, the uh, general manager of or corporate services, uh, to provide a summary of uh, some of the considerations that were given by the EA directors and, and the, the board on the matter. Thank you, Russell, through the chair. Uh, yeah, so I can just provide a quick overview. So uh, this matter was introduced uh, back in February of this year when uh, the directors uh, sought original information on uh, regulations to regulate auto racing. In May, the staff then came forward with a report um, with uh, direction then to proceed with an amendment. That bylaw then came forward to June 14th in which further direction then was provided uh, to make a further change to the bylaw. And then that was all culminated on, Je on June the 28th. So there's been at least uh, four or five different touch points starting again in February uh, in which then it's arrived us to this point. Great, thanks. Thanks for that. And I hope that clarifies both for you, Scott, and, and to members of the gallery, how long we have been speaking about this. Um, um, and that really it wasn't a sudden decision um, that we've been contemplating this and, and working with, um, with the owners of, of Saratoga for, for quite a few number of months. So thanks for, for staff and thanks to Scott. Thank you. Next we have Director Grant. Turned off. Thank you. So, you know, it, one thing that really struck me about this was how we did first or how, how first, second, third and adoption were all done at one meeting. And I know in municipalities, we don't do that. Uh, we're not allowed to do that. And we always have that 
break in between so that you can get some public feedback. And I, and I think it just shows why that works because when you see something, I've never seen anything take off so quickly and so large as this did. Um, you know, I, I think that when you talk about, you know, we tend to think that we sit in these meetings and everybody's paying attention to everything we're doing. They're not. You know, they, they, they're not watching what the electoral service areas are doing over that. It's only when the bylaw actually gets adopted that they go, holy cow, how did that happen? Right. And so I think that's why that break in between is probably really an important step, because I think we would have gotten a different result had we done that a little bit differently. But what I'd like to know is from the CAO, as this goes forward, assuming that this comes back and goes back for reconsideration. Can you just give the next steps as to how this would play out? You know, on the uh, on the agenda is a, is a staff report with a recommendation that the board could uh, adopt, giving us direction to bring back amendments to you for the bylaw that would subsequently be considered at the next board meeting. If it, if it's simple and straightforward, we certainly could turn it around and, and bring something back that addresses the concerns that have been raised by the owner of the, of the facility. That's that's a possibility. As it stands now, the, the bylaw was adopted. It was adopted properly with a two thirds majority. The EA directors had the opportunity to adopt the bylaw in the same meeting. But uh, with the bylaw now, further amendments could be made if there is a need for compromise and consideration of the input that you've received from the owner or the public that's received today. That's, that is an option and we can turn that around for the next meeting. Okay, so we are on receipt of the delegation. Don't see any further hands. So uh, I'll call the question on receipt. All in favor? Anyone opposed? <laughs> That's carried. And we'll move on to the next item, which is the next delegation for Saratoga Motorsports Noise Bylaw, Monica Parkin, Mary H. Wagmakers, Don Macbeth, and Curtis Scoville. Move receipt. Harbor and Grieve, thank you. And the delegation can come up. Yeah, thank you. I'm just waiting to see if the uh, slides are gonna come up on the screen before I begin. And you have 10 minutes to present and then uh, open to questions after that, if you're willing. Got my timer here, thank Great. you. Great, thanks so much. Uh, my name is Monica Park and I'm here representing the delegation supporters of Saratoga Motorsports Park. And um, I just want to quickly say what we aren't, and I think the last speaker covered that, but we are not affiliated with the track owners. I've never spoken to them. I don't have a relationship with them. They're not coaching me on what to say. We're just a group of concerned citizens of community members that want their voice heard. And the views I'm representing today are my own views, and they're the views of the group. They're not the views of the track owner. You all hear me okay? No, this is a walking mic. Um, and the aim is to be positive here, to be respectful, to not be confrontational, to not attack people, and to open a dialogue uh, with the directors, with the other side, to talk about how we can step back from what's happened and find our way forward. Why are we here? So before we get into the why, I want you just to pause for a minute. I want you to think, if you were a business owner, if you're a parent with teens that worked at that facility, you're a community member, how would you feel to wake up in the morning and to hear a business in your community referred to as a stain on that community? Just pause for a minute and feel how that hits you in the gut. And I think when we look at how many people are showing up here today, how many people have joined the group, that is part of the feeling that they had. And that's what propelled this movement, this response forward. It's just one of the things. But one of the main things that I'm here to say today that I want to make absolutely clear is that the other group that presented Saratoga Speedway Complex Concerned Citizens, that they do not speak for the community. They do not speak for the community of Black Creek. They do not represent the views of the majority of the people in that community. In fact, what they represent is 5,800 people over the course of five days. When you want to talk about momentum and response to something, let me put this in context for you. 5,400 people voted in the last CVRD election to vote in the direction, the directors. The average director had 2,000 votes. 5,800 people 
have joined this group. They're sharing their stories, their photos, they're making decals, they're making t-shirts, they're saying, how can we get involved? We care about this matter and we want our voice heard. There's a petition that was actually out before the bylaw was passed, it had about 2,500 signatures on it at that time. It now has 5,900 signatures. Again, three times more signatures than it actually took votes to get a director in. There's a lot of people that feel really strongly about this issue. And I want to be really clear that the community as a whole, as a majority, what's been a silent majority so far, does not agree with the bylaw in the way that it was passed. Again, this is just an assortment of, of the display of the community. How can we come together? What can we do? How can we help? How can we show our support? And the next reason why I think people are upset is something that was touched on here today is the speed that this happened. And I understand that the group has been discussing this for a while, but there was no community announcement. There was no, hey, we're going to have a meeting on this bylaw. You can show up and talk. There was no letter in a mailbox to say this thing is going to happen. And, um, you know, I can go to my office and I can talk about something all I want. But if someone else isn't there in that meeting to hear it, they don't know that it's happening. They're not aware. And so it really did hit people unawares. And we really were caught off guard by it. This opens the door for every other business that comes into the valley, right? People move into an area, they complain about the noise. First, we complain about the speedway is next week going to be the snowbirds, which by the way, I think is the sound of freedom. Um, but realistically, as a business owner, it scares me. It scares me that a business could move into an area. They could have a legally, illegally zoned to operate that business. There's bylaws in place. They've been in place for decades. And in one night, it's gone. How many other businesses could that have to in the future? Like, how if we open the door? And then I want to talk about the social and the economic ramifications. I feel like there's an echo. Is it just because the speaker's behind my head? Do you guys hear that too, or is it good? Okay. Okay. So just a few things right off that Facebook page. There are hundreds and hundreds of stories on that page about different families. This one's from Brooke Olson. His kids have been racing um, with his family. They're the fourth generation to do this, to go the speedway to enjoy family-friendly fun. Uh, Andy Guest posted, um, I really hope the Speedway gets to change another life the way it did mine. There is story after story after story, photo after photo after photo of people whose lives have been changed, who have learned skills, who have had mentors, who've made friendships in the, uh, in the community and at the Speedway. This picture you see here, these are all the teenagers that are employed at that speedway. Kids that live in a rural community where if they want to drive to work, it's a 25 minute drive. They don't have a lot of local employment options. They are saving for higher education. They are learning life skills. They are making friendships that are going to last a lifetime. And I don't know about you, but for my kids, they have a very short window from May to August to save for their higher education. You peel back their hours, two or three hours a night, a shift by peeling back the time that the Speedway can be open and you are taking money out of their pockets. It could be going towards their higher education. And you do that halfway through the summer. They do not have time to go out and find another job and make up that money. Those are not the only people employed at that Speedway. There are 57 people employed at that Speedway. And again, I don't know about you, $304 a month makes a lot of money in my budget. It buys a lot of groceries. It puts a lot of gas in my car. And for some people, it's the difference between making ends meet or not making ends meet. You aren't just affecting a single business owner when you make these decisions. You are affecting a community of people who build their livelihood there. And I want to talk about the other economic impact the other group talked about the negative economic impact of having the Speedway there. Well, I would argue there is a dramatic positive impact of the Speedway. Again, on this Facebook group, person after person after person talks about company coming to visit, going to the Speedway, staying at the campground, spending money at the grocery store, filling their car up with gas, going to local restaurants. The average racer who comes there spends between $500 and $2,500 in a weekend. That's $500 to $2,500 that stays in our community. It is a tourist draw. People come from all 
Baltimore, BC, and they come annually. They come twice a year. I used to go when I was 10 years old when my parents came from the prairies. I still take my kids today. And I am not a racing fan. I'm not there every night. I go once or twice a year, but it matters to me and it matters to the community. And it matters that those dollars stay in the community. One other point of honor, if you look at these posters, the Speedway has been around since 1968, probably before 1968. That means that the people that are making these complaints, they moved in after the Speedway was already there. I don't care if they say they've been residents for years, they moved in when a Speedway was already there and then they chose to complain about the noise. And they had a responsibility when they bought their properties to do their due diligence, to do the research, to ask the realtor, figure out where they're gonna live and understand that there's noise involved. And they have the opportunity to sell their house and to move. We cannot pick up an entire Speedway. We cannot pick up 57 employees and transfer them somewhere else. Those people have other options. The people whose livelihoods, whose inter, um, local entertainment, family-friendly entertainment in a rural community, how hard is that to find? They can't do that. And so I'm gonna say that that noise that we're hearing, that noise pollution that people talk about, that is the sound of community. It is the sound of local jobs. It is the sound of kids saving for their education. It is the sound of family-friendly entertainment. And it is at the heart of that community and it deserves to stay in that community operating in the way that it has always operated in a way that allows its employees to make a living and the community to enjoy it for the four months a year that it is open. Last point is as counselors, you are trusted servants. I know you all bring your own personal biases to things. You filter things through your own understanding. You get information from different sources. Some of that information is correct, some of it's not. What I'm asking you to do is to just set aside those biases, to turn off those filters, and to really listen to all sides, to really hear what the community is saying, what their concerns are, how it impacts the people that live there, consider repealing this decision and let's open a really transparent, respectful dialogue that the whole community can be a part of and have input into. And my very last point, I think I'm running out of town. I just wanna ask for a visual representation. Could I have everyone in support of the Speedway please stand? Thank you for your time. Please refrain from Are you open to questions? Yes, of course. Thank you. I think we have one from Director Arbo who's online. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks. And I, uh, I appreciate hearing, a, a, you know, an in-person voice on this because we've been receiving hundreds of emails over the last week. Um, very much sharing uh, the sentiment that we just heard here from the presenter and the presenter prior. So um, there's definitely a lot of enthusiasm uh, for Saratoga Speedway, and uh, that is definitely noted. Um, I, I would also say that that was also not lost over the last 12 months uh, of work on this file. Um, there's a context to decision making, and uh, and I think it. it as, as we embark on, on uh, consideration uh, after the delegation is an item to look at um, the path forward, um, it's important to, to remind ourselves of the context and, and even for myself of why I ended up voting in favor of uh, the bylaw last week. Um, was it ideal? No, absolutely. This whole issue has not been ideal. Uh, we did not uh, look to, uh, you know, a year ago, Saratoga was not even on our minds as elected officials. It's been existing for years. But, you know, there was a, a fairly significant rezoning application um, that came forward and we spent many months, uh, many staff hours, um, many elected official hours on it. I had a meeting with Mr. Layton at a tour of the facility back in November. Um, and very early on, people should be mindful that the feedback we were hearing in the community from uh, whether it's mild feedback or harder feedback, a lot of it related to noise, you know, and so that's where we realized that there was basically no noise bylaw applying to Saratoga and for the group of concerned residents and others, that whole issue of the rezoning brought that to light. Um, I think the, the hope at the time was to move through the rezoning, move through the public hearing, 
uh, alongside with the bylaw. But when the application was pulled, which was not ideal as well, after we all worked on it, including for the operator, um, you know, it kind of orphaned that noise bylaw. And um, in the early draft, what, what we heard from part of the community, I, I do agree with the presenter that, you know, nobody can truly speak. I'm, I'm from a community that's, that's the same, right? Who speaks for the community? It's, it's all of us in the end. Everybody's got a voice, right? There's no one that can claim it. But um, what we started hearing very loudly was that they were not satisfied early on with some of the 930 and the, the five days. So they, they thought it was too liberal. Um, and we put on something on the table that then, so they were going to vote us out of office. <laughs> and, uh, and then we put something on the table thinking that that, that could potentially uh, meet the test. And there was also a notion of trying to do something for this year because this issue has been going on for some time. Um, it does appear uh, from the response that uh, that went too far, you know, in, in terms of it. And, and I think there's some options that we'll be looking at tonight, uh, some policy options for us to consider. Um, and that's good. It's, it's all part of the democratic process. I think our CEO is right. Uh, was it ideal to do four readings in, in one day as Dr. Greaves said? No, it's not ideal, but we were trying to, to put something on the table for this summer while the topic is, is hot as well. And, uh, and knowing as well that we have so many opportunities, whether it's on the enforcement side, uh, we said we would enforce from a minimum of 30 days from an amendment process. Um, democracy at the local government is, is iterative. It's, it's never quite final. It's always a work in progress. So I, I do want to say that I, I was an economic development officer. I do appreciate uh, the value of Saratoga to the Black Creek community and the Comox Valley, uh, the broader community. Um, if anything, I, I, your comments reminded me that um, many of our decisions at this board often impact livelihoods. Um, we do work on many topics that impact livelihoods and quality of life in the Valley. So I do want to thank you for that intervention and for what I thought you gave a really good voice to the tone of the emails we've received um, for, for, the last, uh, for the last 10 days. So thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you. And next we have Director Hamir. Thank you. And thanks to Monica for your presentation. Um, yeah, I'm just going to echo Director Arbor's comments that, um, you know, we understand how important um, this facility is to the Black Creek community, um, not just economically, but as you mentioned, a place for family and community to come together. Um, so important um, post COVID that we reconnect with each other and remind ourselves that we work in community and that we we're all neighbors. Um, even if you don't live in Black Creek, um, we all, it, this is a small community and we will run into each other again out, outside of Saratoga on the street. Um, and we all need each other to, to make this community a, a better place. Um, so, you know, thanks again for presenting that. Um, I would ask um, if staff could just, uh, review um, the process of how we got here. Um, we had a proposal come forward at electoral areas. Maybe staff could just um, remind us how, how that was voted on and then how it made itself forward to, to the noise bylaw that, that came into being at, at, at the board. Uh, Madam Chair, I think uh, Jake Martin sort of summarized some of the considerations and dates that it was at the electoral area, but uh, the noise bylaw is a matter that belongs, it's a service that belongs to the three electoral areas. So it is a vote of the three electoral areas. And uh, for the purpose of considering matters, we have a committee of the electoral area directors that met and gave recommendations. And then when it comes to the board, it is those three members of the board that then finally vote on the bylaw. And, and would would be the ones to consider any amendments or, or otherwise to reflect the input you received tonight. Yeah, thanks. What I was referring to was um, the fact that this was uh, voted on unanimously by all three area directors, both at electoral areas and at the July meeting. Um, you know, we all felt that uh, that something needed to be done um, because there had been a change in in the use of the track. Sorry, not maybe a use of the track, but at least around the sound buffering around the track. I know for some people who live quite close to where the buffering happened, probably the sound was even better um, in terms of buffering. But I think the removal of the trees 
um, certainly uh, created a change. And change is really difficult for people um, who have gotten used to some things in a certain way. So I think we need to acknowledge that. And the area directors were trying to acknowledge that change by providing um, at least some sort of, of noise bylaw because we lost that ability when uh, the, um, the, the uh, uh, work that we were doing around um, with, with the owner, when, when the owner rescinded his application, um, we didn't have that opportunity to put it into the zoning bylaw. Um, the reason I'm bringing up the fact that this was voted on unanimously is, you know, I, I note in, in your aims is that your group wanted to maintain a, a positive and respectful environment coming forward. And I, I really thank everyone for being um, respectful and, and, and not heckling. But I just need to point out that early on when your group was formed, um, there were some very personal attacks that were placed to members of this board and particularly to myself as a rural director. And I'm just curious as to how and why that was needed. I don't know if you want to respond. Yeah, I'd be happy to respond to that and just say that there's no way that this group condones that. We publicly said that that is not okay. Those posts were deleted. And in any public group where you open a group up to the public, you are going to get some bad apples in there. And it took some time to weed those out. Uh, but no one condones that kind of behavior. No one thinks it's okay. And again, we're just here to be positive, to be respectful, to be proactive. And those bad apples do not respect, uh, do not reflect the views of the group. And I'm sorry that that happened to you. Okay, thank you. Um, I appreciate that. Um, I still do want to emphasize how damaging when something like that happens. You know, all of us here at the table, we're here, um, we're elected here, um, and it shouldn't require courage to be at this table. Um, the idea of intimidation is just not something that should be part of our electoral process. Um, it has no place in, in any kind of politics, be it local, provincial, or federal. Personal attacks are never okay. Um, and so I appreciate the, the apology, Monica. Um, I just want to point out, and I don't know if folks understood how, how impactful this was. I think the first few days that the group formed online, um, people were quite agitated. And I just want to first of all ask, um, where did the idea that the Saratoga Speedway was going to actually shut down? Where did that come from? Because that's not what I heard from the owner when, when I emailed him. I mean, he's asked for a, a modification, but where did the idea that this facility was gonna be at risk because of the noise bylaw, where did that come from? Yeah, I'd be happy to answer that also. Um, first of all, I just wanna just respond to your comment and, and say that, yeah, it's never okay for public officials to be personally attacked like that. I do wanna point out though that, you know, and not that it makes it okay, that the speedway was called a stain on our community like that raises the emotion level and when people's emotions like that amygdala gets turned on their brain that logical thinking part goes away and you're responding out of fear and out of anger and i suspect that's where that came from not okay but i think that's probably where it was rooted uh in response to your other question i certainly have never thought that the speedway was going to shut down i don't think there's ever been a discussion around that the concern is limiting the hours to the point where it can't actually operate properly if it's closing at eight o'clock people come home from work they got to get to the speedway and then all of a sudden it's time to close that they're not that it's shutting down officially but that those actions are one step closer to not being viable and that's my understanding okay so just and if if i can have one last question or one last comment you know um i think we agree that people were really agitated in the beginning possibly by um false information that the, the speedway was somehow going to shut down because of this noise bylaw. Um, it sounds like, you know, as, as maybe um, not a great noise bylaw that was passed that I think we got close and there's probably just going to be some slight modifications needed. Um, but at the same time in that era of, or that time of real agitation in the online group, 
um, a photo of me and my, my children were posted. I mean, that's really difficult to see in a group of really agitated people having my girls. You know, my daughter is 14 and in that photo. It's really upsetting that, that someone thought it was okay. You know, I think there's a real special evil person who does things like that. And obviously I'm emotional because it's my girls. If it's me, I am totally fine to be, to have that attention put on me, but it's just not okay what was done. And I, you know, I think the people who did remove that posting, I have to say that it was me who complained. I know Monica, you, you invited me to join the group. So I read and I saw every comment in the group. I mean, the photo was probably the worst, um, but I did read everything else. And I just wanna say how difficult it was to read comments, um, personal, personalized comments that attacked me, attacked my business, told people the road that I lived on. Why was that necessary? Totally unnecessary. And I don't know what people are shaking their heads out because I have screenshots of all of this. So it, it happened. It's so this is, you know, this is it. 5%, yeah, small, a small number of people can really ruin the reputation of a group. Um, so I think, I think that, you know, you shutting them down, Don, I, I thank you for taking those, those posts down. Um, but it certainly left a bad stain in my mouth. So thank you. Thank you, Director. Next we have Director Grieve. Director Grieve's waiting. Oh, there he is. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Well, let me just say that uh, when you have issues like this, um, you sometimes draw from both extremes. Um, I experienced much the same thing from the other side. I was sitting down to dinner with my son and my daughter and uh, my two grandkids and my wife on Sunday and somebody phoned my landline. So I let it go to the answering machine because we were just sitting down to dinner and somebody on the other side and um, I, I do know who I'm not going to say of course, but uh, somebody on the other side held the phone up and said, that's what I have to put up with every weekend. He, he said, if, if you think that this speedway is a good idea, you should go buy a gun and shoot yourself. So we have those fringes out there. People were coming out of COVID. Everybody's a little COVID crazy. So it's not, it's not understandable. It's, it's not permissible but it does happen. I think uh, the former mayor of Cumberland and, and former chair Fred Bates, when I first got elected, he said, Ed, be hard on the issues, but be soft on the personalities. I think that's what we have to do because we're all human. Some people get a little too worked up and they lose their inside filter. It's not permissible. It's not, it's not, there's no way you can understand that. So it's just to let you know, it, it wasn't just one side or the other that would, that would wound up at, to this level. The good thing about this bylaw is that we have you here. We've got everybody's attention now. So we can take this back. We can ask staff a report. We can mull it over. We can work with the owner and we can come back with something much better, much more equitable for all parties. So uh, I know myself, I read a lot of the emails and there were some really sincere, heartfelt testimonies in there, much like, like you related to, from all over the Black Creek area and beyond. So I think you can't help but be touched by the, the personality of it, the humanity of it all. So this is, a, this is a big issue we have to get right. And as I said earlier, we don't have it right yet. So give us a chance to put this back in, into play and see what we can come up with. Because after all, it's a Band-Aid, it's a temporary measure 
until we actually get a proper uh, development permit for that area rezoning. And then we can we can probably go through this whole process again, but that would bring a lot more uh, public input that we can do, that we could have done for this. So once again, I apologize for moving this forward as fast as we did, but like I say, the upshot is that we got a second chance and we now uh, know a lot more than we did before. So thank you all for coming. Okay, thank you. Next, we have Director Morin. Thanks, Chair. Um, I'm a municipal director, so I don't um, vote on this issue. Um, lived here my entire life, so I'm quite familiar with Saratoga Speedway. Um, I'm sure I know folks in the in the gallery. Um, I have family members who go to the Speedway, live in the area, etc. But I just, I, I can't sit and not um, respond to Director Hamir's comments um, uh, because I, I, I don't think anyone should be alone in, in um, putting themselves out there with their experience. Um, and I'm not saying that anyone here was part of that, that campaign, but anyone who has been following me in local politics knows that um, that I've been quite a voice for uh, representation and leadership, and um, and we know that women and people of color are targeted more often than than others. Um, I'm really sorry to hear what happened to Director Grieve. That was completely unacceptable. It doesn't matter which side you're on. Um, people who are in positions of um, of leadership in the community, nobody should have to endure um, that kind of target. Um, and it, it struck me particularly because of uh, Director Hamir's daughters. Um, I know because I've worked in the field from, for a long time in uh, gender-based violence that, that um, women and girls are more targeted. Um, and these online, um, these online things do carry over to things that actually happen in the community. I have uh, friends in the field across the country. I had a woman who, a friend who was involved in all the, com uh, the women's gaming community and uh, she had to have uh, security okay. protection because she was trying to make video games more um, basically gender friendly and she was, she was receiving death threats. I say that because there is a different experience for uh, women and people of color um, in terms of how they are target, targeted. Um, and I just wanted to lend my support to Director Hamir and um, hope that nobody here was part of that. Um, and I know that people do get passionate about um, their position as we all have. I know that um, before I was elected, I was quite outspoken on some things, but I don't recall one time when I targeted an elected official online, called them a name, threaten their business, um, any of that kind of stuff. Um, you can disagree with people. You can be passionate. You can be even angry about it. There can be conflict, but it really does cross the line. Um, I believe when you target someone's business, post lines, uh, photos of their family. I know that Director Hamir's um, husband is a community volunteer, um, contributes tons to the community. Um, I know that, uh, their family is beyond generous with um, with their time and, and what they contribute. So I I just, as I said, felt that I had to, I couldn't just sit and let someone uh, be on their own in the room to um, defend themselves, that it, um, I wanted to show some allyship there. Um, and uh, that, that's about it, thanks. Thank you, Director. And thanks all the directors for their um, comments. And I don't see any further lights. And so we're on receipt of the delegation. All in favor of receipt? Anyone opposed? And that's carried. Thank you. So we're on to reports. And the next report is a no noise bylaw number 713 feedback. Move for receipt. Uh, Grieve and Grant, thank you. And I'll turn it over to staff. 
Thank you very much, Chair Directors. And the report is self-explanatory. It provides a recommendation for your consideration if you wish uh, for staff to bring forward something different. If you have any questions with respect to the report, the, the writer of that, Jake Martins, is here to answer those. Thank you. And we do have a question from Director Arbor online. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks. I, I think the, um, the report was um, well put together. And I guess in terms of decision today, um, you know, it, it lays out a few of the options we have in regards to this issue. So um, thanks to staff for putting that together. And I have to say, it's been nice to see um, um, the communication, the different lines of communication that have opened. Um, uh, since the decision was made, both amongst ourselves, with staff, with, uh, um, with the operator and owner. And so I know there's a productive space that's been happening while all the, uh, while we continue to receive a, con a, a big flow of emails from everybody. So um, I'm actually, I, I, I will echo Dr. Grieve and Dr. Hamir, and I actually want to extend my thanks to the two of them for um, the work they've done in the last two weeks. Um, in terms of thinking about solutions um, to this. And, and I'm quite hopeful that, um, that we're gonna get there. I also wanna thank the, uh, um, everyone that's weighed in in that time and uh, as well as the concerned citizen. They've, they've come up with some, uh, with some things that we've received that are uh, quite workable. So I think we're in, in a good space in terms of arriving at perhaps an amended bylaw that would meet the purpose of uh, of people, not only for 2022, but potentially if we're lucky uh, for the longer term. So um, yeah, I would be quite happy to direct staff uh, here, make, turn that into a motion after we move on receipt, uh, for staff to move forward to engage with the owner and operator um, and based on the, the, the number of communication we've seen over the last few days and, and to try to uh, work towards a, a, an amendment that would make it quite uh, viable for Saratoga, but also would address the concerns that have arose over the past year. Um, I think that's all I'll say for today, unless uh, we get into a broader conversation about it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next, we have Director Hamir. Thanks, Chair, and thanks to staff for this report. Um, yeah, I was just reading through um, the letter that um, that uh, Mr. Layton sent. Um, asking for um, you know some some slight changes I mean it sounds like we you know we got it right in terms of the five days a week with no racing Monday Tuesday um, finishing at eight on uh, Wednesday and Thursday um, so he's asked for an amendment for the the weekend Friday Saturday Sunday um, and he they pre he presented you know the schedule for the last um, since since January. Um, and so I, I asked him and I shared this information with, with the rest of the board. I asked him, I noted that um, on most of the Sundays, races were over at five and asked if, if he would be amenable to having a five, five o'clock shutdown if the board decided on Sundays, sorry, if the board decided to um, grant the 9.30 on Fridays and Saturdays and, and um, he confirmed that he would be okay with that. Um, so I think if we if we do move forward, I'd just like to make that that slight amendment that um, we asked for an earlier shutdown on Sunday again to to provide the um, the neighbors with a bit of quiet time on on a, on a Sunday and um, but still enable the racing to continue to 930 on Fridays and Saturdays. So if that's amenable to the rest of the board, I, you know, I'd, I'd like to move that forward. Thank you. Um, next, we have Director Arbor again online. Go ahead. Thanks, um, Dr. Amir, for that. Um, my, my preference for today, if, if you don't mind, would be to take those comments and, and, um, and potential solution, but give staff the mandate to work uh, a bit like the recommendation, make it a little more general so that there's a little bit of wiggle room um, for all as they sit back together to, to, for us to consider amendment. Unless our CAO says, no, I would much prefer today to have a firm position, but it feels like um, there's still a few moving parts. And I, I would hate to lock in something today that you know two days later we may find out has some issue with it. You know what I mean? So uh, maybe comments from the CAO and, uh, and also uh, if Dr. Hermier can 
can give her thoughts and Dr. Grieve as well to, uh, to what I just said. Um, the, re the recommendation is to bring forward options. Certainly we can consider those options. We would like to keep the options as modest as possible to enable us to be undertaken in a, in a tight time frame and enable your discussion and debate to be rather simple when it does come to the board because it's not going to committee to provide that extra time. But certainly the recommendation as it is written with the input received by Director Hamir is something that we could uh, work with to give you options as, as, as stated. Thank you, Dr. Grieve. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, yes, let's move forward on this and keep our, our uh, powder dry and see what we can do. I know I often said that race-free Sundays or at least matinees only would be, would be a, a key uh, uh, requisite for public support because let's face it, folks, everybody would love to get out and have one day on the weekend where they could have a barbecue with their friends. So I'm glad that's coming forward, but I just want to take the opportunity here to publicly thank the chair for reconsidering this and bringing it forward because it is at, on her discretion, her discretion alone, that this is happening. So thanks very much, Jesse. Thank you. Director Hamir, go ahead. Yeah. Thanks for that. And echo, echo Director Greaves comments. Thank you. Um, I guess to, to answer Director Arbor, um, my only concern is that, you know, we do have this current bylaw on the books that is, is eight o'clock. And I do know that we gave quite a, a leeway, a, a minimum, like, you know, we didn't ask for, for staff to really, um, look into it and gave, give the track some time. So, um, I think, you know, I'm leaning towards uh, absolutely asking staff to come back with um, with a report, which um, which does uh, take into consideration the recent communications. Um, but I'm just I'm I'm careful of the the time and and maybe the I guess an assurance to the owner um, if we take too long to come back um, and to obviously the people who are spectators who want to who support the track. That, um, that this is done in a, in a timely manner. Thank you. Back to Dr. Arbor. Thank you. My final comment, I guess, is, um, yeah, I, everything there makes sense. I, I still lean a bit the way to CEO to just leave a little bit open. And to be honest, I, you know, if there's a need for us to call a special EASC or anything like that, I think those are things that are uh, available to us and I think there's an understanding we're not going to start enforcing uh, on August 1st on this based on, on the goodwill that's uh, that's around right now. So um, that so Dr. Amir, I mean, if you're okay, I would, you know, if you're okay to move the current recommendation, but the framework that you propose, if it proves viable, uh, yeah, of course, I'm, I'm supportive. Dr. Amir. Thanks. Um, well, I'm just going to ask staff, um, considering the comments that we've just made, is does anything have to be changed in the recommendation to enable, um, you know, consideration of the communications? Uh, Madam Chair, we've got uh, a recommendation that we will bring forward options. We have Mr. Layton's uh, proposal on the table as, as one of the options, your suggested change. That's two options that I'm hearing. That should be fairly straightforward. Certainly, we would confirm with Mr. Layton that his understanding of what you brought forward. So at the very least, you know how, how that may or may not impact right, his thanks. operations. All right, then I'll move the recommendation as, as presented. Yep, we're on receipt. Oh, we are on receipt, yeah, sorry, I forgot. And so I don't see any further lights. So I'll call the question on receipt of um, the report. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried. And now the recommendation. Second. Moved by Hamir, seconded by Grant. Any further discussion on the recommendation? Okay, it's a vote of the areas. All in favor? Any opposed? Arbor, you're opposed? Oh, no, no. I was trying to see Dr. Grieve and Hamir. It's tough being online, uh, <laughs> but I'm, I'm voting in favor. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's unanimous. Thank you. All right, we'll just um, take a short recess to allow the gallery to clear if that's their will. And thanks again for everybody coming today. <laughs> Thank you.
In blue. Oh, Are we still live streaming? Yeah. <laughs> Everyone disappeared.
Can I get everybody back to the table? Come on back. So we left off at report number two, which is the Comox Valley Transit Future Action Plan. Thank you. Um, that's for the um, receipt of the report, and I will pass it over to staff. Thank you very much, Chair and Directors. And Mike Sparsky is here to present the report and uh, with BC Transit and answer any questions. Yeah, thanks, Russell, through the uh, CEO and the Chair. Um, so I'm just going to do a quick introduction, then pass it off to BC Transit. So the first report we have is the Transit Future Action Plan. Uh, we brought this forward, forward to you guys before. It's now essentially nearing the completion stage. The public engagement process is wrapped up. We've worked very closely with BC Transit to you know, sift through all the feedback and develop the service priorities that are, that are identified in the plan. The plan is something that the board can use to guide decisions annually when we bring forward the TIP, which is that transit improvement program. Uh, that's where we get to commit or not to any expansions. Uh, and it's just also a bit of a roadmap for us on, on kind of what service priorities we want to want to pursue, what transit infrastructure uh, needs to happen, what service investigations need to happen. So some of these things aren't, aren't very well flushed out yet. So those are the, the service investigations that we will we will be spending our time on with BC Transit. Uh, and I'll let uh, Melissa in a second uh, give you more of a detail on the Transit Future Action Plan. But the other thing that we, we've included in the staff report is a recommendation to consider a transportation mode shift action plan as part of the regional growth strategy update uh, in 2023. So this is kind of in recognition that there's a, there's a number of external factors to mode shift, so not necessarily related to transit. Transit, we, we've got a target of 3% by 2038. Um, but we have heard also very loudly from the board about an interest in, in shifting people out of private automobiles. And so what we're suggesting is a, is a very kind of action oriented strategy or plan that we could develop uh, next year that would identify those very uh, specific tactics that we could take to shift people out of cars, whether that be looking at the parking supply and cost or building you know, certain types of, of cycling infrastructure or achieving certain levels of transit service, you know, we can kind of come up with a very specific recipe for mode shift. So that is a, a recommendation that's in here that is essentially unrelated to the Transit Future Action Plan. Um, but I just want to kind of highlight that because Melissa is really going to talk about the Transit Future Action Plan. Um, so Melissa Coates is our transit planner with BC Transit. She's here on, on Zoom. And we also have Seth Wright from BC Transit. He's our government relations manager. And so I'll pass it on to Melissa, and then all of us will be available for questions after. Thank you, Mike. Um, I'm just going to pop up the presentation here. Okay. Um, so thank you so much for having us here this evening. I'm really happy to present the Transit Future Action Plan to you. Um, there's been a lot of great things going on in the Comox Valley around transit, and this plan will really support that um, kind of ongoing continuous improvement to the transit system. And um, so I will be going over kind of the key highlights of this plan. The whole entire document is attached to the agenda itself. So I'll go over the highlights and then I can speak to anything else if there's any questions, questions regarding other parts of the plan. So the purpose of this Transit Future Action Plan is to really update um, the, the 2014 Transit Future Plan that we did. So it was a longer term strategic plan. And this plan is really a, a five year action plan. So it really focuses on improvements to the transit system over the next five years. Um, and this plan, it really aligns with, um, you know, uh, existing community plans. So the regional growth strategy, existing official community plans. And it really also upholds um, community goals um, towards sustainability, um, towards equity inclusion, and as well increasing ridership and, and, su and supporting that, that mode shift and increasing transit mode share.
So I'm just going to go over um, a quick overview of the engagement that we did. Um, so just as a bit of a background, um, so we did originally kick this plan off at the beginning of 2020. Um, and that's when we did our key stakeholder engagement. And then the plan was delayed due to COVID and the Fifth Street Bridge construction. Um, so we did use the information that we that from that 2020 stakeholder engagement. And then we did the online public engagement. Um, and we did that in April and May for about a month. Um, so we did an online survey. We also made paper surveys available in the community. And this was a successful engagement. We had 530 survey responses. And as well, we had um, over 1,300 people visit our webpage. And that means about 40% of people who visited the webpage were engaging with us. Who we heard from in the engagement, um, we did hear um, a really large majority of people living in the Comox Valley which is great. Uh, we heard from those who don't use transit at all to those who use transit very regularly. And then we also heard um, people from people who use transit for different reasons. So, um, you know, people who, who may not have another option other than transit, and then also people who are, are using transit to reduce their driving related um, expenses and just for general sustainability, environmental impact reasons. What we heard in the engagement, um, so kind of the general themes emerging, um, things that people would like to see are, are improving service area, improving service frequency, and kind of connections between services. Um, so kind of overall, we had people rank priorities for the transit system, um, and the top priorities that did emerge were introducing um, service to the regional district of Nanaimo, um, introducing service on stat holidays and improving frequency on Route 1. Um, though um, the service to the Regional District of Nanaimo was the highest priority coming out of engagement, um, a majority of respondents did indicate that they would only use this service a few times a year and, and largely to make connections to ferries in Nanaimo. Uh, we also engaged on some routing changes in West Courtney, uh, so changes to existing routes 7, 8, and 5, and introducing a new Route 9, and we really heard some strong support for, for these changes. So now we'll go over um, the service improvement priorities we've identified for the next five years. Um, so these are focused on the improvements to existing services. Um, and this isn't a prescriptive list per se, um, it's just kind of identified priorities and then any implementation of them would be based on direction coming from the board. Um, so the priorities we have for the next five years include um, that frequency improvements on, the, on Route 1, which is what we call the frequent transit network, um, and as well as the existing Route 2 and Route 3. Um, we also have providing service on statutory holidays, and we've identified a potential Sunday level service for that. And then again, um, those West Courtney service improvements. So, so changing a couple existing routes and introducing a new route. Um, and that has some pretty significant investment associated with it, really focusing on improving service levels, um, provide access to, to new places um, like the food bank, and then um, increased service levels to provide access to the farmer's market, which is something that we've heard a lot about. And then also just noting with any of these service improvements, um, there are the some transit exchanges that are nearing capacity as well as the transit facilities. So um, implementation of these priorities may be contingent on, on where these are in terms of capacity. And then we've also identified service investigation priorities for the next five years. So these are things that we don't have expansion resources allocated to at this moment. We need to do a little bit of a deeper dive on them to understand what this might look like. So uh, we have on here um, doing some more detailed service planning for an interregional service <laughs> between Comox Valley and, and Nanaimo. Um, and really undertaking a deeper analysis and understanding um, what what a route might look like and what service levels might look like, and also and also noting um, continuous work ongoing with the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure on any interregional um, transit service provincial initiatives that they have ongoing. 
Um, as well, we have exploring the logistics of implementing a BC transit operated service on uh, both Hornby and Denman Island. Um, so we'd really have to take a deeper dive to understand how we'd operationalize a service on the islands and, and understand um, potentially what service levels we'd provide and, and how things might go for that. Um, as well, we have continuing to work with the school district um, for creating some synergies with planning and scheduling and things like that, um, looking to um, promote that, that student and staff ridership. So looking at opportunities there and as well, um, investigating on-demand services. Um, so looking at what routes we could potentially look at on-demand services and as well, um, kind of exploring the outcomes of our phase one uh, pilot on, on digital on-demand service that uh, BC Transit will be launching in Kelowna as, as a pilot. And then we also have custom uh, transit service priorities for the next five years. So this is the handy dart service. Um, so the identified priorities here are um, continuing to expand the weekday service at the, the peak busy times of day, um, extending the service span both earlier and later. later. Um, looking at the, the service area um, of Handy Dart to see where potential improvements could be made, and then service on statutory holidays as well. So this plan also identifies um, transit service improvements beyond the next five years. So this is when we would come back um, in another five years and then review this list again. Um, to kind of see where we're at, see what's been done and, and update the list. Um, so we've just identified some things to look forward to in the future. So um, we have on this list improving service on the Route 15. So we just introdu introduced that route in March. And that's a uh, route that services Comox First Nation uh, via back road. And then as well, we have service level improvements on the Route 12, the Route 10, and the Route 6. Um, looking at splitting the uh, Route 11 Little River into two different routes. So one kind of going from Courtney to the, the ferry airport uh, area, and then as well, one from Comox to the ferry airport area to make that travel a bit more direct. Um, and then again, kind of have a placeholder here for any on-demand service improvements and kind of identify the, the current on-demand services that are offered in the Comox Valley. Um, looking at ways we could potentially improve that. And we also have corresponding infrastructure priorities to go along with these service priorities. Um, so a lot of these priorities are, are really largely taken from the transit infrastructure study. So we have lots of improvements to um, exchanges identified, as I mentioned earlier, some of them are nearing capacity um, and will, you know, may need additional space to accommodate more bus space for more service in the future, um, queue jump lanes. Um, and then we have also have um, at the top there that transit facility expansion and relocation um, as a as a as a need identified to continue to support service improvements in the Quomox Valley. Then um, we have infrastructure priorities identified for beyond the next five years. And again, these all continue to come from the infrastructure study. So continuing to improve other exchanges identified um, and some signal priority options there. So moving forward, what this plan really does is it, um, it helps identify service improvements that can be integrated into our three-year planning tips process, the, the transit improvement program, um, which we which we go over every single year. Um, and then it just also identifies the corresponding infrastructure improvements that are needed to, to make these transit service improvements happen. And also noting that um, first, uh, definitely some of the, the larger service changes, service priorities identified in this, um, like the, the West Courtney service improvements and the, the interregional service to Nanaimo, things like that. We may continue to conduct some more targeted additional engagement for these things. Mm -hmm. 
So thank you. That concludes the presentation and I'll open it up to questions. Great, thank you so much. And yes, we have some directors with questions starting with Director Arbor, go ahead. Thanks, that's a really uh, um, well presented. Um, I really like how it was presented. It was very clear and uh, you did a good job uh, over the last few months, obviously engaging with the public on this. Um, I guess we're taking a somewhat um, predictable path around, you know, um, short term, the bulk of the expansion resources going to Courtney and Comox, um, the core of the system with 20,000 hours, <clears throat> plus a little bit for Cumberland. Cumberland already has a pretty good service, but I guess we'll enhance it too. Um, and then we kick some of the other things on the TBD. And those are the things that are more in rural areas, which I help represent with Dr. Amir and Dr. Grieve. Um, and some of these move into the longer uh, potential term in 2026 and beyond. So uh, I, I'll just leave uh, some thoughts. Um, and I think you, it's great for the year from the public that things like Nanaimo, even though, as you say, it's a, you have some analysis on the quality of or of, of that feedback, but um, but that it would still emerge as a top priority. I would say that as you look to Nanaimo, and as I see that we're looking to potentially meet all the Campbell River routes number six, my vision is to stop thinking of route number twelve and route number ten altogether, and to think of a route ninety nine that goes from Campbell River to Victoria. I think that's that's how the service will vastly improve for those rural areas as well, both in terms of uh, frequency and accessibility. So that's just a thought, you know, we have two routes that are um, much more sparsely uh, serviced, but I think that hold a greater potential under an inter-regional framework. And with the contributions made to the system by rural areas, I think that's where it becomes easier to tell our rural residents uh, that they are getting uh, service for uh, the amount they're paying and that not all the system improvements are going into the municipalities. Um, in terms of, um, so that's just a suggestion for, for, for uh, the conceptual thinking perhaps that bring two concepts together being the interregional and also the better rural service. Um, the other one is uh, that I'm really hopeful for, and I know a lot of people in Hornby and Denman are as well. Um, it's to link uh, the exploration of BC Transit with the school district as well, because uh, currently the buses on the islands are running in the summertime. Um, and the school obviously runs in the wintertime. Everybody wants to see electrified buses on the islands. So I think there's a great, uh, again, conceptual thought here that perhaps a partnership in that exploration between BC Transit and school district around how we might service the islands in a custom way over the long term and reduce the cost to both the school district, their bus costs and ours. I think that that holds some potential. Overall, I'm very supportive of the plan. I think um, it's great to see the improvement. The, at recreation earlier today, it was interesting that in the aquatic study, uh, lack of public transportation service to our pool facilities was noted, but yet I'm thinking, wow, both, um, you know, the two of the, our three pools are on the number one route. So it's funny that on a be better service route, people still find it insufficient in, in regards to access to our facilities. So yeah, no, we, we need to keep that going in terms of investment in that core corridor. And I'm so heartened to see the city of Cornell and Comox also develop uh, along that corridor everything aligns so well between all the way from OCP to transit delivery. So that's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Dr. Hamir. And, and thanks to, to staff, um, you know, on a really great in-depth um, uh, report. And I'm also gonna sort of pick up on some of the rural areas, um, you know, uh, route number 13, I guess it's, it's a, it's a head scratcher, I guess, for me on demand, I would have thought is something close to what we've been asking for in terms of like, a, a like, you know, something that you could call up upon. So I'm just wondering from staff, um, uh, 
you know, I did note that you're considering like, well, BC Transit is considering more of an on-demand type of service, maybe akin to what um, is happening in Powell River or, or elsewhere. Do you think that that type of service could potentially replace what is currently number 13? I'm, I'm looking at the ridership. It's really quite low. Um, yeah, any comments on that? Yeah, I'll start. And then maybe if Melissa or Seth on Zoom want to chime in as well, they can. But uh, I definitely think the 13 and the 14 and some of those lower ridership uh, routes are potentially good candidates for the digital on demand. So they're right now operating kind of as a traditional on demand. We've had those, you know, phone in on demand type of services for, for many years in the Comox Valley. Um, they don't work especially well, I would say, from a ridership perspective. They do provide other kind of key connections to people without uh, any other alternatives. Um, and, you know, hopefully with the BC Transit led digital on demand, you know, coming in the near future, we could look specifically at those types of routes as, as those key candidates to, to convert into a digital on demand, um, you know, subject to that service investigation that BC Transit is, is suggesting to do. Uh, some of these rural areas, for example, don't have good cell phone service. And so, you know, we need to look into how that situation would facilitate digital on demand or not. Um, but I, I, I think there are a few good candidates in, in the Comox Valley, in, in particular, the rural areas where digital on demand might be a good candidate, um, maybe a slight uptick in ridership. And then also, I think, a more convenient and probably more cost effective service for us to operate. Great, thanks. We have a second question. Um, you know, I'm looking at um, at route number five um, that's going to potentially connect market and, and the food bank. And, and I think that's going to be hopefully something that really boosts that, that service because um, I see that's also a really low ridership. Um, a question came forward from the, the market around timing and of, of buses and location of bus stops. I'm wondering, it's, it's not going to be um, addressed here in this report. It's going to be uh, addressed in the tips. Is that, could you comment on that? Um, yeah, so the, the Transit Future Action Plan is very high level. And Melissa mentioned some additional engagement that we would want to do in particular with those West Courtney uh, service changes that includes route number five. Um, and that's where we would start to firm up some of the details like the schedule and maybe where the bus stops are located. Uh, and that would help then inform that uh, tips that we would come to the board with every, you know, every year is, okay, we, you know, we've done our, a little bit more work and we, we understand more specifically how many hours are required, how many buses. Uh, and in some of these cases with, with bus stops, we're working with the municipalities as well for, for establishment of bus stops. So uh, more work to be done, but landing it on, on the transit future action plan as a higher priority is kind of that first key step for us to, to move forward with that work. May I ask when that tips, when we, it might be coming back? Um, we get them every year and the, this year's is coming probably in September. I've just received a draft from BC Transit. Um, at this point, it does not have a significant number of hours, which would be required for those West Courtney routes, but uh, that's something that we can, you know, look into a little bit more with, with the board if there's an appetite for, for a, an increased level of expansion in the next year or two. Okay, thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> next, we have Director Cole Hamilton. Great. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Mike. And thanks, Melissa. This was very, very interesting reading, and I just wanted to um ask a question about something i was surprised that i guess uh, building on the question about on demand i expected it to be uh to play larger in that uh, bar graph of what would encourage you to take to use transit more often and i guess i had two questions about that um like do you think um you're talking about the traditional kind of on demand that we currently have i don't know how the question was phrased but were people thinking of that in terms of on demand and do you think that might result in a lower level of interest and on-demand. And my second question related on-demand was, did you notice the risk that it was more greatly favored in the, the rural areas versus the municipalities? Um, I'm going to pass that one to Melissa. She's okay. probably a bit more familiar with the specific questions right. okay. that we, yeah. we uh, asked. And she also had, had a bit more of a review on the, the answers that we received and where they came from. So mm -hmm. Melissa, are you able to speak to that one? 
Yes, I am. Um, so for your first question, um, the description that we did have for, for on demand and that specific re question you were referring to um, was a bus that you can request for pickup where and when you need it. So yes, a little bit general in that description. Um, so so I'm not I'm not sure if the the digital component of that was implied or not. Um, but I will note that uh, we did ask for feedback on the current services where on the the 13, 14, and then the the on demand service that we offer, um, which we call the 21, 22, which are just purely by request only. Um, and we did get some feedback from that, that people would like to see a, a digital component to that. So that was good information to know there. Um, in terms of um, how the rural areas responded to that, I don't have that information offhand at the moment, but I, I can get that for you. And I might just add to you that like what I've seen in my research of digital on demand is, is it's still a secondary request compared to frequency. Like, by far the number one request from, from people that want to use transit is just frequent service. They want it every two minutes if they can. So, um, you know, even by making it more convenient uh, or like the on-demand more convenient by making it digital, that's kind of still secondary to having frequent buses every however many minutes. So I'm not terribly surprised by it, by the results of the feedback. Sure, yeah, that's good. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I think, and I was also struck by that. I think three of the top five answers of what would make you ride more frequently are variations on frequency. It's day, then weekend, then evening, which is kind of uh, what one would expect and what seems to drive uh, uptake of transit in, uh, according to research. Um, I wanted to just note that it, on that bar graph, again, it says service area, and that's uh, actually the longest bar of all. Is that meaning like connections like Campbell River and Nanaimo, or is that meaning service area within the Comox Valley, like say increased service on the islands or in rural areas? Melissa, are you able to shed some light on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so when people did um, identify service area as, a, as an option, they were able to type in a response of what area they were looking for. So mm -hmm. we did get a variety of res responses, including uh, Nanaimo, Hornby and Denman Islands, and then um, also kind of request to in, improve areas that are along existing routes like like the farmer's market. Okay, thank you. I was thinking if there's a future report, it'd be really in intriguing, I think, to have that broken down because they're very different things, I guess, the connection to say Nanaimo versus service on Hornby and Denman, they're pointing in, in different directions. Um, I do have one or two other questions, but I'll just stop and <laughs> come back in a minute. Okay, Director Swift, go ahead. Oh, you turned it off. Yeah. Go ahead. Thanks very much. Um, it's always the chicken and egg problem of transit. You know, you need to you need to have it lots. You need to have lots so that people will take it. Um, but I'm wondering, what is your measure of success, and how long do you um, try out a route, and what would be your target to know whether you should continue it or not? Um, yeah, I'll start with, with that one and then you can chime in as well, but the original transit future plan had some uh, service metrics where, where we would say is usually rides per hour was, was the main metric we were looking at. And, uh, so I, I believe that analysis has been done and a lot of the recommendations for increased service are in an attempt to reach some of those service level, service kind of metrics. So we're recommending service improvements to ho hopefully bring up the ridership per hour on some of these, these lower uh, ridership routes. Um, but I think we're also starting to think differently a little bit about metrics for transit and, and maybe it's not all about ridership and not all about mode share and it's start, starting to be maybe a bit more about accessibility and inclusion uh, access to service, you may only have one or two people that are using a, a particular trip on, on a bus at a certain time of the day, but those are super important trips for them to access medical services or food banks or social uh, opportunities or work. So it, it's kind of a, from, from what I can see, a bit of a tough one to measure success sometimes because some of those, those metrics are really difficult to, to get. Uh, and maybe Melissa, if you have any other thoughts on that. Yeah, I would just add that. Um, so as Mike kind of spoke to in in the 
original transit future plan, we did identify what we call uh, service standards and performance guidelines. Um, so when it, to your question about kind of introducing a new route, uh, typically our, what we kind of go for is if you introduce a new route, it, it can take up to three years for uh, really to get an idea of what the ridership will be kind of more consistently on that route. And when we do introduce a new route, um, we look at what type of service type it is. So is it a, is it a frequent, is it the frequent transit network? Is it, is it a local transit service? Things like that. And we have specific ridership targets for those routes and, and we look at that. And then as well, also in the, the service standards component, we identify um, the different service types and um, kind of the target service levels and service spam we want to provide for those services. Okay, thank you. Next we have Dr. McCullum. Thanks, thanks for the report. Um, I'm very happy with what's outlined in it. And I think the, the breakdown of um, the engagement and um, how that's used in our decision-making is really useful. Um, a few of my questions have already been answered, um, and <laughs> I have to admit that I'm maybe it's getting slightly off topic, but um, I did have a question just around um, the free transit um, for youth that came in this year for under 12, um, and uh, whether or not we're still tracking those um, people coming on the bus system if they're not needing to pay any longer and whether or not there has been any change in ridership based on those younger um, passengers. Yeah, Melissa or Seth, maybe you can speak to that. I'll defer to yeah, them. Yeah. yeah, sure, maybe I'll <laughs> type in here. Um, I don't have any data at my fingertips, but we do collect uh, data when the operator on the bus, uh, someone gets on and if they say they're under 12, the operator, keys that in so we can collect that data. I just have to submit a request to our analysis team, but I'm happy to provide that to staff. Um, and certainly um, the methodology that was followed in consultation with the province to, to evaluate that uh, accounted for, for some assumption that there would probably be some 13 and 14 year olds that would get on the bus. So there was a bit of a contingency built into that calculation. And that was sort of felt that that would be more than adequate to, to compensate. Um, I think that uh, our experience in, in talking to operating companies and operators across the province with that program is that it's been really, really successful um, and that it's certainly grown, grown youth ridership, but uh, not put perhaps as much pressure on, on systems as, as we might have uh, been concerned about, um, other than perhaps a few school trips here and there. Thanks for that. Yeah, I, I can tell you that my 12 year old daughter was very excited when she learned that she could hop on the bus without paying and immediately looked at the schedule for a ride downtown. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it did have me thinking about youth participation on the transit system and how it's a, a great time to capture um, people as they kind of develop their own habits around uh, getting around. And uh, when you know, young people are able to get across town, that is essentially a mode shift because they would otherwise be driven around by a parent um, to whatever activity or engagement that they have. And I'm not sure if it really ties in so much to our transit future action plan or if it's maybe more applicable to how we look at the RGS update. Um, but just wondering if there's been much um, thought or um, if there is a plan at all to work with um, you know, North Island College, uh, the school district, and um, looking for ways to kind of capture more uh, youth ridership. Um, you know, I have a high school student that catches the bus periodically, and you know, we just buy a bus pass, I think, every three months, um, I think, or maybe it's every semester. Um, but if there was a way for families to buy, like, a heavily discounted pass annually, you may have more people um, you know, making that purchase once a year for kids that maybe ride the bus a couple times a month. Um, and, you know, that does slowly lead to mode shift and kids learning um, how the transit schedule works and eventually um, realizing that it is an option for getting around. Um, and I think that that's been very successful in larger jurisdictions, but I wonder if there's maybe a, a half measure that we could look at here in our smaller community. Um, yeah, so we did 
fairly recently introduced the semester pass for students um, in high school. We had previously uh, a post-secondary semester pass in place. And the last time the board did a fair update, we, we did incorporate that uh, semester pass for under 19. And I think the next time we do a fair review and bring it to the board, that's that's our next opportunity to consider, you know, even deeper discounts for like a, an annual pass, for example. Um, we are also still due on talking to North Island College about UPass. We had, you know, some prior conversations with with them about that a few years ago that weren't um, kind of very successful. Um, but I think now that we're starting to look at higher levels of service to the college, they now have a, a student residence building being constructed. There's going to be more, more, hopefully more interest from, from them to look at a UPass. Um, and, you know, that's something that maybe Seth can speak to as well. We would incorporate into that next fair review and timing wise, um, I would suggest that's probably coming due fairly soon. We usually do those every, every few years and it's, been since I think 2018 or so since we've done one. Um, I will just say on the fair side of things that we are bringing in, our BC Transit is bringing in the electronic fare payment system to our buses next spring. So, you know, as part of that work, there may be some opportunity to bring back a, a kind of a fair update at the same time. We'll have the tap to pay kind of technology going in and maybe a fair change at the same time is is a good thing. So Seth, do you have any other thoughts on kind of fair updates uh, and timing? No, I think the conversations with North Island College are a good, would be a good start. And certainly these considerations of them building a residence up on the hill and more service uh, to the college uh, help motivate that conversation. Certainly we have uh, a lot of post-secondary institutions with, with U passes, but it really takes a willingness on the part of the student body and the support from either the student union or the or the college administration to to engage in the conversation around uh, around having a U pass, um, but I think that's a great strategy. And in terms of the fair structure, certainly we can we can put the Comox Valley Transit system on the list for for inclusion on a on a fair structure or a fair review. Um, but right now we are currently sort of locked in by the province's safe restart money, which requires us to to maintain fares or not not exceed. Uh, I think it's two point three percent fare increase per year um, until March 2025. Thanks for that information. Um, yeah, that, that all makes good sense to me. I, I think one of the challenges um, with the UPass with North Island College is um, the student society services a bunch of different locations. So it, it, it's hard to look at just the Comox Valley perspective, which is why I was saying maybe there's a half measure where it's like uh, not a universal pass, but um, discounted in some way. Um, I think our fares in the Comox Valley are really reasonable. So I think all this is really about convenience um, rather than um, affordability in some ways. Um, if, you know, kids aren't looking for bus change they and they just have a pass in their pocket, they're more likely to make use of it. So uh, thanks for that. Thanks. We'll go to um, Director Morin and she hasn't spoke on the issue yet. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, just kind of adding to what uh, Director McCollum was talking about. I know we did, um, and this is around fares. I, I know we did talk about when the when we might do an expansion to the thirteen to nineteen um, free fare as well. I just wondered if that's in the works at any point. That's one question. Um, yeah, it's not in the work currently okay. at, at CBRD level. I'm, I'm not aware of any kind of provincial discussions around that. And Seth can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I think, you know, Director Morin mentioned the kind of service oh. frequency is, sorry, call them as the, uh, as the um, kind of key thing for people. Like the, the cost is really affordable already. We're, we're kind of probably on the lower side of things from a, a bus fare perspective. Um, and people are really looking for that higher level of service as kind of the thing that will bring them to the transit system and, and get them to ride more rather than the, the making it cheaper thing. Uh, and, you know, some of the analysis that I've seen on free fares um, in, in other systems outside of BC are giving us some caution around free fares. You know, that, mm -hmm. that is now less revenue that, that we have to invest in service improvements. So, 
not to say that we we shouldn't look at it again. Uh, and I think our our fair review that we do at some point, um, hopefully in the next couple of years, would be a good opportunity to revisit that. Mm-hmm. Um, but there there has to be some caution about that lack of revenue or loss of revenue potentially and the inability to provide a, a higher level of transit service. And I guess I know s- schools do provide um, bus passes to um, to you know young people that are lower income, et cetera. I guess that's coming out of their own. They're paying full full um, price for those. I'm assuming there's not some kind of partnership with social service agencies and, and schools around. Yeah, that's that. correct. They okay. they do buy a number of bus passes and tickets from from us at full full fare right okay. now. Um, and then my other question, and, and I don't know, maybe this is something that needs to wait. This is really about a policy, but you brought up the the comment about equity, inclusion, and and those kinds of things. And you know, the example of of those high, you know, maybe low ridership, but has high high impact in terms of accessibility. And something did come up recently, and and you know, put me off if you need to, but something came up recently about. Um, uh, low-income folks who are uh, wanting to carry recyclables on the bus, and there had been a um, and I, there had been a policy where um, they could bring that on the bus pre-COVID was my understanding, and then since COVID, that's changed, um, supposedly because of health and safety, etc. And I just wondered if if we could get a, because I understand that's a BC transit policy. And I just, I don't know if, if there's a way to answer that question, but it did come up in terms of, um, you know, there was someone who contacted me who has a, uses a walker and literally had to walk across town with her walker, with her recyclables. And mm-hmm. yeah, it just brought up that piece around people with low incomes having so many barriers and now they can't even take their recyclables on the bus. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Seth, are you, are you aware of the policy around that? Yeah. Thank you. And through the chair, uh, just that policy was indeed implemented during early in COVID. And I think at the time, if we reflect back uh, at the sort of uh, thought thinking of the time, it was that um, that anything you touch would be contaminated with COVID. And I think that policy was uh, was implemented in earnest with that assumption. And I think that that policy has not been rescinded, but maybe is perhaps overdue to for, for reconsideration at the very least. I think that there has been pressure from some of the operators to maintain that policy because they're concerned about some of the other impacts that uh, not allowing uh, recycling on the bus and it enables them to, to decline certain clientele. Um, but uh, certainly we'd want to ensure that we are allowing folks that have recycling to be able to deal with their recycling in a, in a reasonable way. Um, thank you for bringing that up because um, I think yeah, I think that that has happened where, um, yeah, some some clientele maybe it's been used to refuse. Um, and I think, you know, you can have checks and balances around it. And I guess if the policy was in place before, hopefully it can be brought back, even if there needs to be some other guidelines around it. Um, obviously not leaking and maybe there's a limit of bags or something like that. But I... I really felt for this woman who literally had to walk across town with a lot of people um, and was in a lot of pain afterwards. So I wanted to bring it up. Thank you. Thank you for that. And we'll go to Director Grieve again as a first time speaker, and then we'll get to Director Arbor and Cole Hamilton as second time speakers. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. And thank you very much for the report. I'm just wondering if there was any feedback uh, from my constituents in the Dove Creek, Piercy, and Plateau Road area. Um, they consist of about 600 homes, and they are currently unserved by any transit. Um, no handy dart, no infrequent deviated bus system. Uh, also, just to mention, they don't pay into the service, which could make them a, a potential customer. But I'm just wondering if the uh, if the uh, the plan recognize that at all um got one more after that yeah melissa might be able to recall if any specific comments came in from from those areas that currently don't have service um dub creek forbidden plateau i don't really remember seeing anything 
maybe there was one or two, but Melissa, do you have any recollection of that? Um, just from what I can recall, I, I do think there may have been a couple of comments about Dove Creek. Um, I don't believe it was um, overly significant that it, it wasn't noted as a key theme coming out of this engagement, uh, but, but we can take a, a look in detail at, at the specifics of what we did here there. As I say, they were left off the map early on with transit. So a lot of people aren't even aware they don't have access to Handy Dart. And of course, what we're experiencing is the uh, aging population trying to age in place. So maybe that's something we should put on the radar. The other one is uh, regarding the uh, what Director Arbor brought up a little earlier was about the connectivity through to the Nanaimo bus system. And maybe Director Arbor can speak to this later as well, because he is on the Federation of Canadian Municipalities as our rep for BC. And I know that one of their priorities is to connect uh, different rural constituencies. So um, every time we bring that up, it keeps booted down the road. So I'm, I'm wondering maybe transit, BC Transit isn't the entity we should be talking to. Should we be maybe talking to uh, or setting up some kind of other uh, contract with some other private uh, provider because um, it's, it's a high priority at FCM. It was mentioned by the Minister of Transport when I talked to her, but it keeps getting booted down the road. Maybe you could comment. Uh, I can just do that quickly. The, um, the priority is definitely, you know, recognized, I guess, in, in the Transit Future Action Plan and something for BC Transit to investigate. Um, but I will also say that the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure is doing a not sure what it's called, a review or an analysis or a plan around interregional transit throughout the uh, province and also very specifically on, on Vancouver Island. So we're, we're kind of monitoring that piece of work to see where that goes at a provincial level and then also working with BC Transit to do kind of a, that investigation where we could determine what uh, kind of local public transit connection would look like with Nanaimo. Because I believe there is federal dollars for that. Uh, sorry, on the implementation of the service or on the, on the review? Or on the service, on, on recognizing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, obviously, obviously, since the demise of Greyhound, this has been a, a burning issue. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I know that we are very urban centric overall on the transit, and that's okay. But uh, I do think that there is uh, definitely um, a need out there for people of low income. Uh, to be able to get from here to Nanaimo and get to Vancouver and get to their doctor's appointment or whatever. So I, I think it's something I brought up since 2011, but it doesn't seem to gain traction. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Director Arbor, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, um, I'm, uh, I like Dr. McCollum. Well, I like all the comments from the colleagues, obviously, but. Um, I, bearing in mind what uh, Mr. Zbarski said about free fares, I still think we haven't quite found the transformative nugget uh, in transit in order to really jack up. Um, so I'll tell you what I just did. Uh, we have a, an, an item later on in the agenda, which is to review uh, the regional contact statement because Courtney is doing their OCP. And so it led me to the transportation page on the OCP for Courtney. Currently, 15% um, sustainable modes between transit, cycling, and walking. So I guess we're going to be doing a lot of walking and biking because they, they have a target by 2030 that 30% of trips are going to be by sustainable modes. 30%. We're going to move from 15 to 30% in the next, next seven years by the new OCP. But we are seeing that by 2030, transit is going to be 2.5 or 3% mode share according to this transit future plan we're receiving today. So that leaves 27% to walking and biking. You know, you know what I'm trying to say here is that our, our, um, our ambitions are not matched and our investment doesn't match where we're trying to get to. So the reason why I bring this up is it, it, it wouldn't be the first fail plan that we have. We have a lot of fail plans in terms of uh, <laughs> ambition, but I think 
at next next term, I'll be the first. It's been has been toying within my brain just to ask for a report to look at if we make transit free for 21 year old, 25 year old and younger. What does that look like? You know, right now that's the generation that they're trying to get a car. The insurance is killing them. Insurance premiums have gone so much higher for young drivers. And is there a way of customer acquisition to develop habits? 12 years old, they're riding with parents most likely, right? We're giving free transit and it's going to be probably occasional trips, I, I imagine. But if you want to shape habit, it's those formative years when people are in college, heading to university, starting jobs. Why not giving them, them a real incentive to get on? I know Victoria has talked about this. The reason why I'm bringing it up, it, it may not be the, the golden bullet, you know, the, the bullet that solves it all. But what I'm saying is we haven't found it. And it's going to be increasingly hard to keep investing more and more in the transit system if it doesn't help us more in, in transiting in relation to other goals that are found in, in our OCPs or climate goals or otherwise. So, yeah, it's a tough one. That's just a free commentary. But just in support of, of Dr. McCollum, you know, I, I would be curious to see if we had the adults pay three bucks rather than two bucks and everyone under 21 rides free. How do we model that, right? So if we if we pay a little more, I'd be happy to pay a little more as a working person. I don't know. It, 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 there's still lots of questions, I think, on the fair and financial side to explore next term. Thank you. Um, if I could just kind of speak to that, you know, this is kind of getting into that other recommendation that's in the report here about a transportation mode shift action plan. You know, we can continue to invest in public transit and bike infrastructure and pedestrian infrastructure um, but at the end of the day, it is extremely convenient to drive a car in the Comox Valley, and we do not have the conditions right now to really see a significant mode shift. Um, we have free parking everywhere, pretty much. There's really no traffic. We have a lot of, um, you know, parking supply, so it's it's easy to drive, and it's very hard to compete with uh, with that when we're we're talking about transit or, or cycling. Um, and so that is, I think, the, the purpose of this, this regional transportation mode shift action plan is to really identify those, those things that we need to do as a community to get people to, you know, rapidly uptake on transit, walking, biking. It's not just about improving transit. It has to be kind of a, a balanced thing where we're, we're making cycling better, transit better, but at the same time, we're making it harder to drive, less convenient to drive, which pains me to say, but that is what you need to see a big mode shift here. Thank you. Director Cole Hamilton, go ahead. Thanks for being patient. Thanks very much. I'll try and keep this brief. We've been talking for a while. Um, in terms of mode shift, uh, last week I happened to be in Kingston, Ontario, visiting family, and I had dinner with a friend who's a counselor there. And he was talking about uh, how they managed to get a 72% increase in transit ridership over the course of six years um, from 2011 to 2017. And that was attributable to a few things, one of which was a sort of a 48% increase in, in hours of transit service. But he said primarily working, uh, focusing on core routes and increasing frequency. So you just, there was always a bus coming and that seemed to be, I mean, it's, it's a complex problem, but that seemed to produce a fairly remarkable uh, result. But looking at our own, I, I was pleased to see the, you know, as Director Arbor says, we have a distance to go, but uh, the report states that we had a 25% increase, for instance, 2014, and considering the pandemic hit, that's remarkable to be still carrying a, 20, a one quarter increase over that time. And the report also notes that um, we had a significant increase in kind of bounce back post pandemic compared to similar sized transit systems. And uh, would seem to indicate we're doing something right here, which other people aren't doing. I'm kind of curious about uh, if there are any lessons to be learned from that. And the last thing I want to say is one fact that really struck me was that the average uh, trip distance was 6.9 kilometers, which is a long way. I just looked up the distance from downtown Courtney to downtown Comox is 5.2 kilometers. So 6.9 for the average ride, that um, it certainly shows mode shift. People would be driving those routes if they weren't taking that bus. Um, I guess, and, and I was just curious whether Melissa or Seth know whether that kind of length of ride uh, is typical of, of uh, sort of rural urban communities such as ours. So I guess my question was, how did, what caused us to bounce back more quickly than others from COVID? 
and whether there's anything to be learned from our sort of um, what seems like a fairly significant average ride distance. Um, yeah, I can start maybe with the response and then Seth or, or Melissa chime in. Um, from what you know, I've seen, I think some of the, the key keys to our bounce back are that we had invested in a high level of semi, semi-frequent service along the main corridors. Like you mentioned, that is a key for ridership is mm-hmm. frequent service in a dense area. And so we, we had put that in place um, just prior to the Fifth Street Bridge mm-hmm. rehabilitation project. Um, so we did have a good good level of service. Um, and then I think another key factor was was the transit priority lane. I'm calling it a transit priority lane. It was the um, not in general traffic lane. So we didn't have to share it with ambulances and those guys too. But, you know, that was a huge benefit to riding transit. Everybody that was stuck in a private automobile waiting to get across the bridge, watched buses going up that uh, bus lane. And, um, you know, I think those are, the kinds of things we need to invest in moving forward is those transit priority infrastructure pieces where a bus is the preferred, it is given priority over the private automobile. You know, we have to kind of deprioritize the private automobile and prioritize these other modes. And so I think those are a couple of the factors that led to that bounce back. And maybe I'll just let uh, Melissa and or Seth kind of chime in on that and also speak to that trip length question. Yeah, definitely. Um, I just want to note um, so that that trip distant um, that that measure was taken from the the Comox Valley Mobility Primer. So that's not um, for for transit trips. That was kind of a measure of, of trips generally in, in the valley. So I just want to clarify that piece. Okay, thank there. you. I think I, I may have misread that. Okay, that's the useful to know. Thank you. Um, and in terms of the bounce back, were there any other sort of uh, factors that are applicable to our region that would have uh, caused a higher than average bounce back? Um, it, uh, it's, it's hard to know for sure, of course, um, but I would say that the Comox Valley didn't reduce service levels at the onset of the pandemic. There were other transit systems that that did do that due to the, the lower ridership and and or reinvested service levels elsewhere and, and Comox Valley um, we, we did maintain. So um, that that could be a contributor to that as well. Um, and then, of course, um, during the Fifth Street Bridge construction, where we were able to have the the transit priority lane, I think that um, that could have definitely helped maintain or, or increase ridership for, for those um, not wanting to be stuck in traffic during that time. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Um, yeah, my thoughts on on the report are, you know, that. We don't have too many things in in local government that we have um, control over as far as lowering greenhouse gas emissions, but transportation is one of them. And um, it's a little bit um, disappointing, I think, every time when we get these reports and there is um, uh, such a low percentage um, as far as um, mode share uh, with transit. Um, And I, I, I think, you know, what Director Arbor says, we haven't found that golden nugget. We haven't found that thing that that is going to make the difference yet. Um, and I, I keep coming back to the the on demand because um, all through the report it said convenience is is the number one thing that is driving um, people's decision on what mode of transportation, and it's not necessarily um, the cost. Um, that it, that's really about convenience, and so you know. Um, I think more and more people are used to um, a, an on-demand service. They're used to Uber and, and other things like that. So um, if it is about convenience, that seems to be the route that would make most sense to, to find that golden nugget. But it seems like every time we have these conversations, like there was a pilot um, in Northern BC that BC Transit was working on uh, at the beginning of this term, when we talked about on-demand transit, and now they want to test another pilot in Kelowna um, and put off our possibility of getting on-demand transit by four years again. So, um, yeah, f- to me, that's a little bit of a, a problem. I would like to see that much earlier. Um, and I guess my question to you is that, um, I guess, like Director Gree's question about should we be looking outside of BC Transit um, and doing something like um, Power River is doing with their um, Zunga bus service um, to see if we can find that golden nugget in on-demand transit? Um, 
I think, you know, especially for the younger generation coming up, like um, what would you see in every um, youth's hands is, is a cell phone. And um, they certainly are, are used to that kind of service. And I think that um, if we could provide that to them, that that would be getting the next generation um, into buses. So um, just wondering about the question about possibility of, of going outside BC Transit for that service. <laughs> Yeah, we can definitely go outside of BC Transit service um, for digital on demand. It would be at 100% our cost, unlike the BC Transit model where, where we cost share that uh, at about 50-50. Um, we would be doing obviously all the work around kind of developing a project and, and reviewing it ourselves. Uh, but if the board is, is interested in doing that, you know, that could be something, you know, we could bring a report back at another uh, meeting to kind of scope out what that might look like and how it could move forward. Yeah, and I think that versus, you know, providing free transit, um, you know, the cost might be more effective and we might actually find that um, it does shift um, more. So um, I don't know if what the board feels about that, but um, yeah, that's something that I would like to explore. Director Arbor, go ahead. Sorry, third time speaker, I know it's ridiculous, but transit is a passion. Uh, we kind of have a, as on a bus going wildly and no one knows where it is but it I, I i happen to know i think it's on denman island so denman this summer has their regular bus that does ferries to ferry mike probably can inform us more a little bit but they have this wild pilot where now they have another bus which is a dutch caravan and i think it's randomly driving around and looking for customers. Mike, I'm sure that's not the case, but can you shed light on whether that's an on-demand uh, trial that's happening? Um, yeah, so we've been working with Denman Works to uh, run the bus again on Denman, second, second year in a row now. And we've kind of shifted more of the responsibility over to Denman Works this year. And they've contracted with Ambassador Transportation, which was the, the private contractor that we contracted with last year. Um, we just had the one bus uh, kind of bouncing between the ferries last year. And so that is still in place. But as Director Arbor mentioned, they've also had a, added a second vehicle, a minivan. Um, it does have a bus route. When you look at the website, at least I, it appears to be on a route, but I'm not too uh, familiar on exactly how they're adhering to that route or if they are deviating off and kind of trying to scrounge up more business. Uh, and, I, and I don't know at this point how well it's been received, but we can bring a report back you know, later in the, in the summer once we have better stats from Denman Works on, on the performance of that. Uh, and that may, you know, those may be ones that we would want to convert into a, a digital on-demand pilot should we want to go, go it ourselves because we are already doing it ourselves essentially with Denman and Hornby. Um, so, you know, we would have to do a little bit of work to review the, the feasibility of, of converting those into digital on-demand. Uh, I have heard cell reception on both islands is less than perfect. So that may be, it may be a challenge, but we wouldn't know until we do a little bit more research on that. Great, thank you. Okay, I don't see any further lights. So thanks so much to Melissa and Seth for joining us today. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. And we're on receipt. All in favor of receipt? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. And there's some recommendations. So moved. Sorry. Arbor and Morin, thank you. Any further discussion about the recommendation? So that we approve the Comox Valley Transit Future Action Plan as attached in Appendix A. And that we utilize the guide of the future transmit, transit investments as part of the transit annual transit improvement program. Okay, so both full boards, all in favor? Anyone opposed? It's carried unanimously. Harbor and, or sorry, Hamir and McCollum, thank you. And so recommendation two is uh, development of the Regional Transportation Mode Shift Action Plan. Any further discussion? Again, a vote of full board, all in favor? Anyone opposed? That's carried, thanks so much. All right. Moving on to another transit topic, Comox Valley Transit Facility Report. 
McCollum and Cole Hamilton on the seat. Thank you. And I'll pass it to staff. Thanks. That's Mike Smart again. Yes, thanks, uh, Russell, through the CEO of the chair. Um, just a quick introduction again, and then I'll pass it on to James Wadsworth, who's uh, our uh, project development manager at BC Transit. And he and Seth Wright will be there to answer questions as well as I will. Um, so this is a, a piece of work that we've been working on for several months now with BC Transit and also a consultant, Morris Hirschfield. Uh, reviewing the existing facility and kind of developing the concept of a future operations facility to, to support transit service. Um, this would help us achieve a number of goals uh, that this board has, including electrification of, of the bus fleet, uh, expansion of, of the transit uh, service itself, so adding more buses. Um, and at this point, we're asking for kind of a support in principle of advancing this, this project, which would kind of the next step would be to, to get into the property acquisition phase. Um, and we would be bringing things back to the board before any final purchase is completed. Uh, so at this point, there's really no kind of financial obligations or risk uh, for, for giving BC Transit that kind of support in principle to, to, to move forward. And, um, and then even should we give approval later on to purchase a property, there is still more work to be done around the facility design and the business case and the, and the cost analysis, which would be brought back to the, to the board before actually developing a new facility, so actual construction. So there's a bunch of steps uh, that we're gonna need to take here. And, and this is just one of the kind of first ones just to keep the board in, in the loop on, on where things are at and make sure uh, there's some support to move forward with it. So with that, I'll pass it on to James Wadsworth. Thank you. Let me just uh, find my presentation here and uh, share. Can you can you see that presentation now? Yes, we can see it. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. As Michael said, we um, we've done some preliminary planning to understand uh, what a transit facility might cost. You know what. What scope does it have? Um, where would it make sense for it to be located? Uh, and, and as we said, it, it really uh, supports the ability to expand uh, service in the future. We have an understanding that the existing facility can probably support eight additional uh, expansion buses. Uh, we also need to develop a plan to make sure that we're enabling supporting the electrification of the, the fleet. Um, this can help us reduce some of the costs depending on you know, the location where we find uh, uh, deadheading buses running in and out of service. Uh, you know, we do understand that you know, we currently spend, I think around $650,000 on fuel in the annual operating budget. So electrification of the fleet changes that. Uh, we, we also like to own and control uh, the sites for BC Transit when we're looking at making significant investments in electrification of the fleet. Uh, we've done some recent projects in Campbell River, uh, Cowichan Valley, and Abbotsford for new transit operating uh, centers. These are still diesel or compressed natural gas facilities. They're not electric bus facilities. Uh, we're developing plans with some other communities, including Nanaimo, Squamish, Chilliwack, and Kelowna for um, electric bus facilities. Uh, we, we, as you know, we do have plans to electrify the fleet. The goal at the provincial level is to have a fully electric fleet by 2040. Uh, we, we do have a vendor now, Proterra, for battery electric buses. Um, we are going to deploy a 10-blast trial in 2023 in Victoria to better understand the technology and how we work with it. Um, as I think Mike mentioned, we do have the ability to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from the transit fleet in the valley. Uh, it also, there's a benefit to reduced air pollution. Uh, they can be quieter and smoother rides. So it's maybe nicer for the customers. So it's quieter for uh, the community in terms of the bus circulating through neighborhoods. And as we mentioned, they're there could be some reductions in operating and maintenance costs, but there are also some increases in costs with the cost of the facility, the cost of electrification, the cost of the vehicle. Um, 
As mentioned, we did do some preliminary planning work with Morrison Hirschfield. We looked at the existing facility on Knight Road. Um, it does provide us bus maintenance and office space today to support the transit system. It's leased uh, from the operating company. They also use the site for other purposes, um, for, the, for maintaining other vehicles and storing a, uh, storage of vehicles on site. It, it isn't, uh, you know, it isn't the most modern facility, it's an older facility. Um, and, you know, that's important in its ability to be electrified. It would, there would be significant increases uh, in investment that we would have to make on the site to have the proper maintenance capacity to have um, the electrification of the site. Uh, we did do some work to understand what are the functional needs for a future facility so we could understand the cost and the size of the site that we might need. Uh, we did do some uh, high level work on identifying, you know, how different locations could function in um, the valley for, for a facility. And we did some phasing and costing. Um, uh, some of the key functional attributes are that we need a five acre site to uh, accommodate up to 50 or 60 buses in the future um, based on the transit future plan. Of course, we need the charging equipment, places to park the buses, uh, a large enough room that, that we have uh, room for future maintenance bays administration. And it's important that we have room to have a service island to make sure we have clean buses and wash them, um, as well as parking. When we're designing our facilities today uh, with uh, clean, the clean, uh, clean BC, um, policies, we do need to develop them to a, a lead gold standard. So we're, we're using products and making sure they're energy efficient. Also, we do a safe design certification. Um, and if we were looking to develop plans in the future, we might not need the full um, site for buses, but we would phase it over time. Potentially, we had an initial phase for 42 buses, which aligns with the service plans in the transit future plan. Um, in terms of funding, what does it cost? We did uh, uh, class D cost estimates. Uh, we believe that land is likely to cost two to eight dollars uh, for a facility and to construct a facility depend when it's built. Uh, it could be 25 uh, to 35 million dollars for a battery electric bus facility. Um, that's the, the tough news, but the good news is that there is uh, federal and provincial funding available, which really reduces the local share of costs to approximately 20%. Um, so it's great to take advantage of these programs uh, when they're available. Unfortunately, um, land at this time is not eligible for the federal funding. And so we still have to cost share land at the traditional rate, which is about 53% um, on the local side. Another thing, um, you know, so we understand that uh, for the regional district that it's likely that this could cost uh, six to $10 million for their share of the portion of the facility. But the good news is, is, that, is that that could be contributed all at once, but there's the ability to pay an annual uh, lease fee through the annual operating agreement over 30 years. Um, and that's likely to be somewhere in the 250 to $500,000 range. Um, and we don't charge these fees for these types of projects until the facility is in service. And, and as mentioned, these are potentially what the next steps could be if we wanted to move, uh, move forward. Uh, on a project, we would be looking at what are the property auctions and how do we acquire it. Uh, when we do these types of projects, we, we set up uh, several touch points with, with council along the way, coming in and checking in on where the project is with more information and asking for approvals to continue to move forward. Um, with, in other communities, we've gone out and purchased property and then held it strategically until we're ready to um, advance uh, a project and then bring that into service if we have an approved project um, to move forward with. You know, once we do have land, we, we like to do more, more work on understanding what the design of the facility would be, get it 
up to the 50% level, uh, increase the cost estimates because we, we want to make sure that we're mitigating the risk of all the parties and, and having accurate costs before we go force, uh, forth, develop a business case and make an application for federal funding. So there's, there's still lots of questions to, to answer about the project and in doing more planning work to develop a business case helps us develop information to bring back um, to the board or to senior level of, of, of senior levels of government um, to check in and make sure we're on the right path before we make that application uh, for federal funding. And so along the way, um, as I mentioned, we did uh, usually the next step is we, we uh, develop uh, some agreement around the property or develop a project term sheet um, to confirm what the scope of the project is to move it forward. We come back and check in with local governments on that. Um, and typically this process, it isn't a quick process. It usually takes somewhere between three to six years to develop a plan, acquire property, do the design work, develop the business case and secure all the uh, approvals and funding to move forward with and construct. So that's a, a quick synopsis of the reports that you have. Um, and, and thank you. Thank you very much. So good presentation. And we do have a question from Director McCollum. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, just one number, and I, I'm not sure if I missed it. But um, so I, if we were to go with if this project proceeds and we assume a 30 year lease, that would be a, about a half a million dollars a year to the service. What are, what are our current leasing costs um, at, the, at the site that we're using now? Uh, maybe Seth can speak to this as well, but I understand they're very hard to extract because the, the contracted operator is actually leasing a facility and building that cost into the the hourly rates that they charge us. So it's it's not maybe explicitly detailed. Um, Seth, is that a fair description? That's right. Effectively, the current operator and partner provided the lease of that facility as part of a package of goods that's commercially confidential as part of their bid through the RFP process. And so we can't uh, we can't access that information or share that information in, in a public forum. Um, so so we don't have that information to share at this time, unfortunately, um, for comparisons. Okay, um, fair enough. So um, there would likely be some type of cost savings, but it's hard to nail down yes. what Definitely. the difference would be. And I understand that. Um, and the other question I had is, is our electrification of our fleet contingent on finding a new site then? If, if this were, if for some reason the board didn't like the idea, um, what would what would happen then with um, as BC Transit electrifies? Like, um, would we just end up with obsolete buses? Or so you're able to? I think BC Transit has a strong preference to have long term ownership and control of the properties that we're making investments in for the electrification because there's costs to bringing the power to the site. Uh, there's the costs of uh, capitalizing the equipment on site. Um, you know, that being said, in the in the interim, you know, buses are moved between properties. Um, so, you know, it doesn't preclude existing expansion plans, but over the long term, it makes more sense uh, from BC Transit's perspective to own and control the sites when we're making these types of investments in communities for, for transit. Yeah, that's totally understandable. Thanks for the clarification. <laughs> Alternate Director Theos. Thanks, Chair. Um, curious uh, about the um, uh, about the battery for these um, for the for these uh, buses, these electric buses. Um, the 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 um, the lifespan estimation of the batteries that are being used and uh, and the replacement costs of those batteries uh, when when that comes to fruition. Um, also, I'm, I'm interested in knowing uh, with the, um, the, the uh, types of um, electric uh, buses that are available today, 
um, the, the variety of sizes. So uh, just interested in whether we are going to be considering or whether there's going to be a consideration of um, smaller buses um, uh, or if that even exists, uh, you know, with electric buses. Thank you. I think I can speak to the the order that we're doing things is is right right now we have um, a contract to procure um, the larger bus forty foot buses um, and I think there's you know future plans to electrify the uh, medium duty and light duty buses um, that BC Transit has but we're starting with the heavy duty ones and unfortunately I'm not a transit. Uh, I'll call it a battery electric bus expert. We do have members of the team who, who know all about the, um, the range of these buses and, and what how the batteries work and how they're changed out. Um, so I think that's information we can probably go and get some more information and report back on. Thanks. Dr. Arbor, go ahead. Thanks, it would be great if, uh another Crown Corporation uh, decided to pay for all these uh, electrical upgrades to these new facilities between Crown Corporations, you know, that friendly uh, uh, partnership would be appreciated by local governments so we don't have to, to bear it here, but BC Hydro uh, is going to be involved in all of that. And it would be nice to see the province create a program that helps BC Hydro basically both on the, uh, the planning side and, and the cost side uh, uh, help to help BC Transit to do that across the province and save, save, us the, save us the cost. That'd be great. Okay, wishful thinking aside. Uh, I, I think we need to move this forward um, in the sense that um, it, it, it sounds like it, it, it's going to happen. You have a commitment by 2040. It's, it's a matter of, I guess, when we would fit in that whether we'll be early adopters or later adopters, those might be kind of the um, thinking that's before local governments across BC, because I don't anticipate you're gonna do everybody in the same year. Uh, it would be nice um, if you were, if there was an, a, a possibility in the next couple of years for you guys, once you have more detail including some of the answers to question, uh, Dr. McCollum, if we could go in camera and, cern and learn some of what the financials look like, uh, because we're facing cost increases across the board as local government. We do want to head in that direction, but um, the, the earlier we can wrap our minds around um, the status quo versus that shift and, and, and how much it's gonna affect our finances, I think the better. I um, don't know if you have any comments on that, whether you've shared that with other regional districts in camera or whether BC Hydro has often to foot the bill for all your adventures. <laughs> I, can, I can say that I know our battery electric bus team is, is looking into different grants that might be available to improve the affordability of, of the buses. Um, I don't have news on that today, but it, it actively ongoing. We're looking for ways to reduce uh, the costs for, for local government. Um, I think as we move, if we decide to, to move forward there, of course, there would be probably in-camera conversations on, on the property options that, that we don't have uh, in public. Yeah, and I would just add that there, there's going to be a more detailed business case with financial costing and analysis that would come at a future date. Um, once we have a property, you know, and, and kind of been purchased, we know what the property costs are. We can develop the design. We know now what maybe a more accurate uh, construction cost would be. And at that same time, I would hope we'd be, we would be bringing in information about the electric bus cost savings or hopefully savings anyway, and deadheading savings, and also possibly some discussion around what the existing facility lease fees uh, could be. Um, so I think that's, that's definitely going to come to this board before we are on the hook for the construction of the site. Thanks. And I assume all this takes phase three power. Yeah, that'll last forever. 
lots of power. I don't know if it's phase three, um, but uh, I know James uh, Morrison Hirschfield was engaged with BC Hydro in the in the review of the electrical capacity within our local grid for some areas of town. So I think you know there there's some confidence that the amount and type of power is available uh, in most of these locations, but I, I can't say if it's phase three or not. Thank you. Yeah. Dr. Grieve, go ahead. Thanks, Madam Chair. I would strongly urge caution um, in moving forward to the board. Um, we like sparkly new things, but any reasonable person looking at the economy today realizes we don't know what's coming around the corner. We haven't seen the worst of it, that's for sure. This is probably the worst time in the world to actually look at property purchases or building anything. Prices are sky high. We don't have to lead the parade on this. I would caution everybody to take a good hard look and to wait and see, the wait and see attitude, what, what the economy is gonna look like in a year or two. But rushing ahead at this point in time, I think is a responsible use of taxpayers' money. And uh, I will not be supporting it. Thank you. Thanks, Director. Come here. Go ahead. Thanks. Um, I'm actually maybe even leaning towards what uh, Director Grieve sentiments. So that's a bit of a surprise, I guess. Um, my concern is just um, if staff can can remind us how the service, how how all the individual participants pay. Is it on a population basis? Because um, understanding the rural areas, who are probably the lowest users of the service, um, what I don't I don't quite fully understand what what our share of the the cost would be. Um, do you have a, an ability to to describe that, or is this something that would require a report back? I'll just ask Kevin uh, Deville to come forward and, and share what he can with you. Otherwise, we can look into it too. Uh, through the chair to the director. So currently the transit service is funded through an assessment based model, similar to most of our services. So each jurisdiction that pays into that service, it's uh, portioned based on that percentage of assessment. Okay, thanks. Um, you know, I, I think when we first discussed uh, electric buses back, I think it was our first year of being elected and at UBCM, we were told then that um, that the smaller size buses that we in our community were really requiring that electrification was still many, many years away. Um, and the fact, you know, we were not certainly at the top of the list um, for electric, electric buses. Um, has that changed? And so that's a question to, to maybe James or, or someone can answer. I think we're we're in the process of developing a provincial plan about how we roll battery electric buses out. Um, so it, it's a plan that's going to take uh, till till 20, 2040. But we, uh, with understanding how long it takes to develop a facility plan to come back to the check ins to go through the approval processes, uh, we're starting to work with communities now so we can develop plans for each community that supports their their transit future plan and the, the greening of the of the transit fleet. Okay, yeah, I'm yeah, just concerned about the cost, you know, echoing a little bit of what um, Director Grieve is saying um, and, and having a facility um, that may sit um, empty in terms of, of electric buses until such time as we finally get one. I know it's a chicken and egg situation, but it uh, it does feel slightly premature for us. Understanding it's going to take you know four or five years to get this um, this facility built, but um, you know we were told you know four years ago that it was going to take s at least seven years for Courtney to get an electric bus. So I'm just um, I'm a bit concerned cost wise, but. Um, and, you know, not to say that, you know, we do want to move in this direction, but um, trying to figure out when when this happens and, and how it's paid for, what the options for payment are. And finally, I guess what it would it's going to cost the, um, the taxpayer 
I, I'd like to know a bit more of that information before we move forward. I, I think. James, did you did you want to finish that? Um, I, I was, yeah, I was. I think just to be clear, what we're we're under, uh, what we're asking for today is not to approve a project, but to to indicate um, if if we can continue to develop preliminary plans to answer some of those questions uh, that that everyone should have when we're looking at these types of investments. Yeah, you know, I'll just add, I guess, on the land purchase caution um there is another opportunity before that purchase happens for this board to consider this this project and you know i think if we give bc transit some support to move it along a little bit they'll be able to firm up what that purchase price could be and do some analysis around you know is this, is this a good price do we think that the real estate market is going to change in the near future and we should hold off on on this or not so i feel like there is another opportunity for the board to have better information before making kind of that final commitment on a, on a property purchase. And then there's of course the, the, the subsequent, you know, opportunities for the board to weigh in on actually constructing this facility. And at that time we'd have a much better business case prepared for the board. Madam Chair, could I ask a question of James? And that is, James, if the regional district had property that was suitable, it was the right size and in a favorable location, how would how would providing the land be credited towards their contribution to to the building and and the the overall cost of the project? Yeah, my understanding is when we were would be looking at that, we'd understand what the value of the property is, and that value of the property. Um, it could potentially fund fund the local government share of the cost of the land and the facility. As a, it could be the contribution to the project, but we'd have to look look at that. Uh, I think scenario if it if it was available and report back uh, with some more information on what that would would be if that was a, a viable option. Thank you. Next, we have Director Grant. Yeah, I was looking at this, and you know, when you're talking about costs in the I, I don't know forty million dollar range in a time like now is probably as bad as it could get. We have very low ridership on our bus. It's actually a bit of a joke in our community that we've seen another bus go by with nobody on it, and then to go out there and spend or even contemplate spending this kind of money. To electrify a bus system that not that many people are using, it seems really hard for me to swallow. So I, I won't be a, a I won't be going with this either. Director Michael. Um, well, at this point, I am supportive of continuing um, forward. Uh, at this point, we don't really have enough information to make a decision. So in my mind, we would benefit from looking at it further. There could be some operational savings in terms of what it costs to run uh, an electric bus, and we don't really know what we're paying currently for that lease. So um, by proceeding now, at least we'll have a better sense of whether or not this is a yes or a no. Um, you know, other factors are, are what we're really interested in is mode shift, and a new transit facility isn't necessarily going to move the needle on that at all. So. Um, I certainly do have some reservations on investing half a million dollars a year for 30 years if it's not going to do that. But at this point, we don't actually know what the real um, annual cost would be or even a, a real estimate. Um, BC Transit has said that they want to electrify by 2030. This is the three to six years out. Um, maybe we'll get electrification either way, but I just don't really see a, a downside to us getting um, further into this process before we make a decision. So um, for that reason, I'm, I'm gonna support the recommendation. Thank you, Director Morin, go ahead. Great, thanks, Chair. Um, it sounds like uh, the, the areas that, that proceed with this, because you said that there's conversations happening with other areas would be 
kind of in a better position when electrification happens. Like, I guess I'm wondering if um, delaying this uh, would um, delay us in getting getting electric fleet. Um, and on the flip side of that, it, it almost, if that's the case, and it, it's kind of almost like pressure to, to agree to this to, uh, to get higher on the list. I guess I'm wondering where, where um, in the queue uh, you sit if, if you decide not to, to proceed with, with this. Um, and yeah, I, I guess it, it seems like you're gonna have preference if you go through with this. So I'm just wanting some clarification on that. Well, one thing I could say is, is, is this a tough decision to make an investment in, in a transit facility because it's a significant, a significant cost. Um, and we've had some communities, unfortunately, really put it off. And we've got to a point with their transit future plans where we can't really expand expand service um, in that community to meet their long-term needs, their, their mode share needs, or even deal with problems with people being passed up. So you're, you're not in that situation right now, but uh, we, we're trying to proactively work with communities so we don't, we don't get um, into that situation or get really close where it's only one to two years out and we're trying to rush um, solutions and make decisions um, that that could lead us uh, down a less than optimal path if we're we're limited in, in options. So that, that's why we do work with with communities, and we we do know that there's lots of questions around how does it work, what does it cost, you know, where are we in the line, how do we get expansion, or how do we get battery electric bus, uh, and so you know we've done a, a small amount of work uh, with a small budget to to get some understanding of what it could cost, and so it's. It, it's we we do need to work uh, together to to do some more planning uh, to answer those questions. So sorry that might have been a bit of a run on run on answer, but I was just trying to think of an example of of well, what kind of missed the boat in another community. Yeah, I mean it does it does sound like you need to pay to play a little bit. Like you you need to make that investment locally into the facility to be able to get higher on the list to for the electric fleet so um that's yeah that's sort of the way it sounds thanks you know i think just to add to that as james kind of pointed out like definitely that having this facility would allow us to be up on the list a little bit higher for battery electric buses but but james's uh point on expansion is, is also very important uh this trans future action plan that we just you know heard about um, requires additional buses and there's only so much room to grow at the existing facility without a, a significant expansion investment at that site. Um, so yeah, it's not just about a battery electric buses and I just want to make sure we're kind of keeping that in mind. And, and I guess maybe James, if you can speak to the grant funding opportunity as well. So we're, so we're talking about um, CBRD's share being in that, Two fifty to five hundred thousand dollars per year range. That's based on eighty percent senior government funding, which is available now. Is that funding available five years from now, ten years from now? That's the big question mark that I, you know, would kind of raise right now. Is there is a good opportunity uh, from a senior government funding perspective as well uh, right now? Yeah, I, I believe that we put a small amount of information in the report about if we didn't. If that funding wasn't available, um, or we missed an opportunity, what what it could cost if if that cost share agreement isn't there, and we were looking at at the local government unfortunately having to pay pay closer to fifty percent at some point in the future. Yeah, I think that you know what I I share the concerns that I'm hearing around the table, but I think that you know we don't have all the information. Um, just a, as an example, um, this new building that we're in, um, we used to be leasing a space and, um, and you know, it, it made sense to build this new building because the mortgage um, on this building is equivalent to what we are paying as a lease um, before. Um, so we don't have that information here um, in this regard. We know that we would pay a 53% 
of land value on the one side, but we don't know what our current lease payments are on the other side. So we don't know if those would be equivalent and cancel themselves out or, or what the cost implication would, would truly be at this point. So I, I think there is a uh, reason to, to move forward in um, just to be able to, uh, to uh, have a, a real better idea of, of what those costs are. Uh, Director Cole Hamilton, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I was going to say something very similar to what you were saying. I think uh, the concerns I'm hearing around the table are primarily financial. I think overall, I'm assuming most of us want to see mode shift. We'd like to see greater use of our transit service. And um, we can all see that there are savings to be had with electric vehicles in terms of fuel and in terms of maintenance. But then so because we don't have all the numbers, and I was going to raise a, a similar point to the chairs, that uh, usually um, owning a building, if you have a long-term outlook financially, is more is more beneficial than renting a building. And uh, although we don't have the numbers in front of us, the report says that BC Transit and CBRD contribute funds for the, for the lease of the current facility. So clearly this can be a net benefit. There's going to be a net there between the existing costs and uh, any future costs. I, I, I think that I, I can understand the uh, people's economic concerns, but I think we need to have more information before we can really see whether those concerns are, are, are fully justified, partially justified, or they may be misplaced. Uh, so I will be supporting this uh, and look forward to getting some more kind of flesh on the bones in terms of being able to make a really clear financial decision further down the road once we have more information. Thanks. Thank you, Director Cree. Go ahead. Yeah, this does impact the electoral areas quite a lot. As you probably know, we pay 27% of the budget and get about seven to 10% of the transit hours. Uh, if it's based on uh, assessed property value, I think uh, Director A, uh, Director from Area A pays about almost the same as Comox. So just to put it in perspective. Thank you. Alternate Director Theos, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Uh, now, going down the road of exploring further um, the uh, possibilities of, uh, of moving in this direction uh, in the future, uh, those are potentially dollars that could actually go to improving the system today that would be spent on an exploration of a potential um, um, building and land and, and uh, vehicles that uh, we may never ever see or we may see 10 years from now or 15 years from now what are the what are the expectations of the costs um short term to continue exploring uh, going down this road and who would be paying for that uh, cost now, madam chair as uh, as presented to us today if you uh, adopt this resolution no no costs are to you the work will be done by bc transit right and it will give you good quality information for you to make a decision at a later date. You're not making any commitment to, to purchase a property or anything, but, but it's the analysis that, that uh, BC Transit will undertake to help you make that decision. And I, I would really encourage you, even if I hear what you're saying, Director Grieve and others that are concerned about the cost of lands or other things, but I do think that there are viable options there that might put you in the driver's seat and then give you some opportunities to, to gain benefit on, on this. And in fact, it'd be a, a truly a win-win for, for the taxpayer of the area, but we really need to undertake this work and do the analysis, but I, I do think there are some viable options for you that uh, would be well worth, worth undertaking this work at this time. Okay, so with that, I don't see any further lights, and we are on receipt. So all in favor of receipt? Anyone opposed? That's carried unanimously, and there's a recommendation. So moved. Uh, McCollum and Arbor, thank you. Any further discussion? Okay, and it's that we approve in principle the concept. All right, is the both full board, all in favor? Any opposed? Two opposed? <coughs> and that's carried. Thank you. And I think we will take a 10 minute recess now for dinner.
Okay, we'll invite everybody back. We left off on uh, reports number four, the committee of the whole from June 28th for receipt. Move receipt. Uh, Arbor and Hamir, thank you. And is there any discussion on the committee of the whole minutes? Seeing none, uh, on receipt, all in favor? Any opposed? That's carried. And we're on to item five, which is the regional contact statement request for acceptance from the city of Courtney. Move receipt or move the recommendation? Uh, yeah, move receipt. <laughs> uh, Cole Hamilton and alternate <laughs> director <laughs> Theos. <laughs> okay, and I'll pass it over to staff. Thank you very much, uh, Chair and Directors. And uh, this is my first time to introduce Robin as our Manager of Long Range Planning and Sustainability. And uh, she will introduce the report and answer any of your questions. Thank you, Madam Chair and Directors. I'm here today to bring forward the City of Courtney's request to consider acceptance of the revised regional context statement as part of the new OCP process. This is a statutory requirement for the city of Courtney and the local government act requires that an RCS be accepted by a regional board when an RGS applies to that municipality. The RCS must specify how the OCP policies address the RGS policies and is expected to be generally consistent with the RGS's um, goals, strategies, policies and land use designations in the RGS. Staff have reviewed the RCS as a part of the OCP referral process and determined that the OCP policies and RGS policies are in alignment and staff recommend that the board accept the RCS as presented in Appendix B. Through the potential update to the R RGS, staff will work with municipal partners to develop an RCS framework that will um, guide the preparation, evaluation, and acceptance of the RCS. Developing such a framework will ensure that the RCS is fully utilized as an RGS implementation tool. Thank you very much, and I'd be happy to answer any of your questions. Thanks, Robin. Are there any questions? Director Arbor, go ahead. I'll, I'll be brief. Uh, I, I just want to say I did read it. <laughs> so uh, that, that was good. And I, I was heartened to see that uh, there's no plans for uh, extensions in the next 10 years uh, with a focus on growth in the core area. So that question, believe it or not, does happen uh, in our rural areas from time to time. The last big extension in my area was the Ridge, I guess. Uh, but it, it was nice to see that uh, there's no such plan for the next 10 years. Thank you. Thank you. And I do have a question about the framework. Um, as Cumberland is probably going to be heading into their OCP process next year, is this going to be a much more rigorous process for the regional context statement for the village of Cumberland? Madam Chair, I don't see it as being um, overly onerous. I see it as being more um, instructive in the sense that it would really be quite clear in identifying what that content should be and being really um, specific in the sense of, of how we would like the RCS to be uh, structured in such a way that it's very specific and very intentional. And so the, the um, intention of this is that it would be very uh, easy for the board to be able to review for acceptance, but as well for staff when they receive that RCS when they're evaluating it in terms of whether they're in alignment. So it's really meant to be a tool to ensure consistency and as well to ensure that the RCS is fully speaking to the RGS's policies. And we will be working with municipal staff to, to develop that together. So that should Cumberland be undertaking this work next year, that, that uh, Cumberland staff would be a part of this process and would be able to, to, to use that when, when working on that RCS statement. Great, thank you for that. Director Hamir, go ahead. Thanks, Chair. Um, also, you know, really thankful and, and happy that uh, 
the OCP, as I'm sure all the other <laughs> court and counselors are really happy that this is over. Um, but, you know, it's a very in-depth document and, and I thank staff for taking the time to go through it and really point out where there's some, some great alignment. I wanted to ask about um, the community parks and the Seal Bay Nature Park extension. Um, would staff be able to comment on, you know, where, where that's at? Is this just initial conversation or, and how much time and energy may be putting forward? What timelines you're looking at? I would ask Dr. Marzo to be able to speak to that, please. Oh, that's looking a bit uncertain. <laughs> you don't know about this. <laughs> Oh, okay. Uh, Director Hamir, we do have comments that were provided as a part of a referral process, and City of Courtney did confirm that those comments were incorporated. But I could, I could get back to you to provide you with more of the specifics regarding your question. Okay, thanks. I mean, I just want to mention that fully support this. Um, it's actually something that I heard from many residents in the Seal Bay area is that they would love to um, commute into Courtney without having to go on the highway and that Seal Bay would, would offer such a great corridor. I think it matches very much some of the comments we've had around the table on our regional parks strategy around um, you know green greenways and connections. So whatever we can do to support that moving forward would love to see it. Okay, great. Seeing no further hands, we're on receipt. All in favor? Anyone opposed? That's carried and there's a recommendation. No. Grant and Amir, thank you. Any further discussion on the recommendation that we accept the regional contact statement around the city of Courtney? Okay, and it's a vote of the full board. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Thank you. And next we have item six, which is CVRD Director's Remuneration Bylaw Update. Uh, Grant and Hamir, thank you. And I'll turn it over to Sal. Thank you very much, uh, Chair and Directors, and uh, James Warren, Deputy CAO, is here to uh, present the report and uh, help answer any questions. Thank you, Russell, and good evening, Directors. I'll be very brief. Um, you recall in, in April, we presented a staff report that uh, provided an analysis of your remuneration bylaw. There were um, several points of discussion during the meeting and, and a request to report on some opportunities to provide a more um, diverse and, and, and broad opportunities for individuals who might want to run for office. So this report uh, explores several of those options, um, describes an implementation process for each of those and, and a rough range of costs, although it's highly variable given that um, those costs would be um, very dependent on usage. Uh, the recommendation in the report is still to um, proceed with the uh, changes to the bylaw as, <clears throat> as presented in April. Um, but certainly we're here for any, any discussion or questions you may have at this time. Great, thanks, James. And we do have some hands, starting with Director Premier. Thanks, um, and thanks for to staff for going through this and providing us with the details of the costs. Um, you know, I'm actually, I'm considering supporting all of them. I don't, I don't think there's any one of these that um, is unnecessary. My only question is, um, especially since extended care seem to be like the bulk of the, the dollar amount, um, providing um, extended health for people, you know, over the age of 70, the $20,000, um, what was that based on? I mean, how many directors um, were you assuming in that in that dollar amount? If it's all of us, I mean, awesome. But I mean, yeah, it, 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 what was it based on? I think the quote at the time and the way the benefit plan is structured is that it's it's um it's a plan we have with our benefits provider and uh, and they they quote what our costs would be to provide for extended health um, and to go beyond that that age seventy resulted in a twenty thousand um, dollar cost. So I don't think it was based on one particular director or or any particular number of directors. It was the benefit plan as a whole. Okay, so. 
that one, I guess this, this is a little bit now confusing because some of the costs were based on potential if it was actually used, like the um, family care um, and maybe even the transit pass. But that one seemed to be like that's just going to be regardless if anyone uses it or not, that's going to be an amount. Um, okay, I guess the, that's something to consider. Um, if nothing, I think actually the transit pass, like especially after the conversation we just had about transit, I think that's an easy something that we should be providing um, to encourage more um, busing in. But um, yeah, I'll, I'll wait until I hear you know the rest of the comments. Thank you, <clears throat> Director Moore. In the next, um, thanks, Chair. So these additional items would all require their own uh, policy to be introduced individually or how would I, that work I, I tried to identify what the implementation would be and some would be um suitable for a policy others would require an amendment to the bylaw so it's a little bit variable um, mm -hmm. um family care for example it would i think make sense to include that in schedule b of other remuneration bylaw whereas others um a policy might be more suited because it doesn't fit well within the bylaw so the, the implementation section under each would be would be um, how the board might want to consider implementing um, any of those particular options. Okay, so the, the recommendation would include everything in terms of a, looking at, at all these areas then? The like recommendation in the staff with... report now doesn't yeah. recommend okay. any additional ones. It's only focusing on the um, chair and vice chair. Right. Um, sorry, specifically the vice chair payments and then the increases to the chair, vice chair, EA and municipal directors. So I guess when I, uh, I guess when I hear Director Hamir saying she agrees with them, they would still need to all be looked at in their own, in their own way, all these areas. If, if the board were to support uh, any of the additional areas, extended health, family care, parental compassionate leave, retirement savings plan allowance, transit benefits, um, then I think a resolution directing staff to right. bring back the appropriate policy or, or right. bylaw amendment would be, um, would be appropriate. Okay, thank you. That's what I was getting at. Thank you. Next, we have Director McCullum. Yeah, thanks. Um, I guess I'll get my thoughts on these quickly, one at a time. Um, the extended health, I don't see a good case to extend it um, to the cost of the organization of $20,000 a year, potentially indefinitely, because it might not get looked at again. I think um, coverage to age 70 is pretty standard across um, uh, even a really great extended health plan. So um, I, don't, I don't feel supportive of adding that cost. Um, to the board. Um, the family care one is pretty low impact. I think there's a good case to be made to look at that. Um, parental and compassionate leave, I had a question around um, the cost. It says that it would be 15,000 a year if two directors opt, but um, with those costs, um, it, it seems to me that's not an additional cost. I mean, the cost of having the, I, it, the directors on the board is is budgeted for a full board. So really what it would be is a cost savings if if someone were to take parental or compassionate leave and we not provide a benefit. But I don't see that there would be an additional cost um, to what, you know, to a normal year. So um, I think that unless we were talking about backfilling a director, which I, it, as far as I know would be impossible, um, the retirement savings plan allowance, um, I don't feel like that's something that we should tack on. It's probably something that we should look at at the whole package if um, we're going to look at it, given that all of our um, comparables were uh, based on other jurisdictions. Um, that's really an additional amount that we would be uh, receiving. and. Um, I think that's really added compensation. It's just, um, to me, I think we're talking about additional benefits and, um, you know, it would be great if I was 
able to uh, take my director's wage and add that to my pension, but it's not the way the system works. And um, if we want to include uh, enough money for retirement savings plans, I think that's really should be included in the compensation and not added added complexity into how directors are paid. And um, I can't really see a downside to providing transit passes. Um, although perhaps it could be opt-in or out um, with a nominal fee. I assume it would be a taxable benefit. So um, there may be a consideration there. Um, I'm not sure if, James, you want to um, answer about my uncertainty around the $15,000 um, as yeah, an no. example of two directors taking parental or compassionate leave. Yeah, I think I think you're you're certainly right in the sense that that's a budgeted amount that we would have for um, for the remuneration for directors for the year. Um, the there would be some backfill is not the right word, but the alternate directors for the EA directors, for example, would would uh, be able to attend meetings in their absence. And, and similarly, municipal directors have alternates. So there would be there would be some added costs. It wouldn't total the fifteen thousand dollars. I think we were we were imagining. Um, we were looking at the remuneration costs and then extrapolating that over the months. Um, the, the important part about that particular direction, if the board wants to pursue that, is, is around the, um, um, the current legislation that, that um, I'm not sure if it requires disqualification, but certainly a policy would allow the board to um, enable absences um, in, in the case of parental and compassion. So. Director Grieve, go ahead. Thanks very much, Madam Chair. My recollection was that the uh, exploring the potential um, benefits as opposed to monetary uh, compensation uh, was a, an alternate idea rather than continuing with the cost of living increase. Do we not get a cost of living increase currently? The current remuneration bylaw does calculate an annual increase based on the previous year's consumer price index. And that's written into the bylaw as it currently is. Mm -hmm. The recommendation and, and the previous staff, staff report from April spoke about a, a fixed increase. Um, it's in the, one of the tables in the staff report. And, and the recommendation would be to insert that fixed increase in as opposed to relying on the CPI or a cost of living index. Um, mostly because of the uncertainty that that, that introduces. The, there's, no, um, there's no ability to, to budget and have an understanding of what those future CPI amounts would be. And so, um, so the recommendation that we put forward is that there be a fixed increase. So we're forfeiting that. If the board chooses to go with the recommendation that's in the staff report, then, then we would amend that bylaw to introduce the fixed increases. If I was negotiating as one of your public sector employees, would that sound reasonable to you? <laughs> we enter negotiations with our, uh, our, our unions, unions all the time, and we certainly look for that cost certainty um, as we go forward. We want to understand what is uh, what are some of those pressures that we're facing and, and, and what are those costs that we're going to have to budget for. Um, well, I, I personally, I mean... I, I question the extended health care thing because there's only, I think, two of us over 70 years old. And uh, I mean, even when I was on, and also important to understand that it's a 50-50 split. So that means that uh, we would have to, we would be, have to pay 20,000 out of pocket to, to uh, pocket the other 20,000, $40,000. <laughs> A year? I, I don't think so, folks. Um, I know when I was previously on, on the plan, I mean, I, I don't do any any uh, prescription medication and I can't deduct my mega vitamins that I buy at uh, Edible Island. So <laughs> that's how I stay healthy, folks, you know. That and, I, and I have some good honey browns once in a while. But um, yeah, no, I, I think this is unacceptable. If you take a look at the... Uh, uh, the uh, SRD to the north of us, the electoral directors are making nearly 50,000 a year. I think that's exorbitant, but still, and they get their extended medical because they're on a different plan than we are. I think they're on Green Shield and we're on Blue Cross, right? So they have a different plan. So I don't think this is acceptable in any way, shape or form. Is it, I think you can't have it both ways. I mean, what if we just paid our, our, our our 
workers at the, at the uh, aquatic center. I mean, you know, that, how can you justify that? How can you square that? I mean, I know that elected officials are supposed to be basically getting a small stipends for volunteer work, which is what we're looking at here. But, you know, um, we talked about bringing in the, the, the benefit and to try to compensate because we have some young members. We have some people who have, have, have kids. Uh, we have people who, uh, who uh, need, need uh, extended medical, um, you know, that are over the age of 70, that magical age where they're supposed to deteriorate. Um, yeah, I can't see how we can support this in any way, shape or form. It's certainly not fair. Either one way or the other, you would get a cost of living increase and for, and forego all the other benefits, or we get some some tangible benefits that that you know aren't added to your income tax. Yep, Madam Chair, just want to qualify that it's twenty thousand dollars because that's what the provider estimates it to be, and it's not about providing it for one or two people. It's about opening up for the potential of individuals seventy years and older being part of the plan. It's just it's the cost of doing business. And I think the issue for you is, do you want to provide that benefit to those that are over 70 Then pay the $20,000 and put it in place. But it's, you know, it, we're just giving you the estimate that's to, as provided by our provider. And, and just on the, um, on the analysis that was done on the comparator organizations, we did look at Strathcona and, and several others, and they're noted in the report. That's that's where some of those figures are coming from. Um, and in that analysis, the the rates around the Comox Valley Regional District are are not out of line. Um, in some cases, they're slightly above the median, and in some cases, they're slightly below the median. Um, so they're certainly not out of line in respect of those comparison organizations. And and we presented that in this report back to the CBRD to the board. Thanks, um, Director. Come here, go ahead. Thanks. Well, um, listening to the discussion around the table, it sounds like um, maybe only three of the the proposals are are, are going to be supported: um, the family care, the parental leave, and and the transit benefits. It sounds like um, if you know, however these are put in place, if they're not used. Um, and we still have that budget in, in, I guess I'm asking what service would this live under and can we, can we keep unused funds in, in that service if, if they're not tapped in? So this falls under function 130, which is your, your um, general government and municipality and EA administration services. Um, we would budget for the anticipated expenses yeah. and, um, and, and make those payments as, as needed throughout the year. Um, any sort of unspent funds then are, are they're, they're in reserve or unspent? I, I don't believe we have 100 and 130 reserves. We do. Kevin's going to get up and help. <laughs> I guess what I'm trying to say is um, it's not going to be an ongoing cost if, if those funds are not always allocated that, you know, we, we may be able to provide a bit of a buffer, but maybe Kevin can... Yeah, so through the chair to the director. So yes, James is correct. Those would live in those 100 and 130 services for a member municipality administration and EA administration. We would certainly budget them accordingly based on, as James alluded to, those anticipated costs. If for some reason those costs came in under those, those budgeted thresholds, then yes, those funds could theoretically stay within that service, uh, whether as a carry forward of surplus into the subsequent year or, or certainly as a, a future year contribution reserves. Sure, thanks. Um, I just want to note that, you know, I think the, the idea of this came up as a way of, of um, incentivizing or enabling people to run for, for office, um, knowing that they may have to incur some costs that not everybody does, and, and just to lower the bar for um, people who, who ha have access um, issues. So I'm, I'm after we move, after we um, have um, you know, vote to to receive um, the recommendations there, but I, I would like to move those three to go to go forward. Um, I'm going to go to Director Swift as first time speaker. 
Thank you. Um, I think that um, I could support the transit pass. I think that's really consistent with what we've been talking about tonight. Uh, but coming from a municipality where we don't offer any of these um, benefits, it, it could create some potential awkwardness um, at the council table level. So I, I would prefer to leave the recommendation as it is, um, with the exception of perhaps um, adding the transit pass. Dr. Bree, go ahead. Well, I hate to use the word age discrimination here, but I feel at a disadvantage because uh, my cohort across the table that sits where Mano is right now is not here. And this definitely affects uh, uh, Doug as well. I mean, we're not looking for big money here. We're talking about a pittance out of our $150 million capital budget. And it's not like we're greedy garden go goats here. Look at the rate of inflation, folks. Look what's happening. Do you think it's gonna stop? It's tapering. I don't know. I mean, I think this does a disservice to the people who are in, in public service. And uh, I definitely uh, would argue for extended health because I don't think it's going to come anywhere near 20,000. I think that that person is smoking something I'd like to buy. Director Morin, go ahead. It's always fun to follow Director Grieve. Um, I actually don't have a problem with including the extended health. Um, and, and actually, just to Director Swift's point, Courtney is, is looking at this as well, and we've voted for um, uh, renew, 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 can't even say the word. Thank you. Um, uh, to, uh, to increase next term with also looking at, um, childcare and all these other things for exactly the same reasons. And I think it really is the way that, um, you know, respectfully, hopefully Co-ox does take a look at that and, and Cumberland and other local governments, because, it is it is a barrier and you know what director grieve I, I i do see your point and it feels like ageism but frankly older people tend to be at the table um i don't have a problem with it, with supporting the extended health piece um i really think though that we we have to find ways to properly compensate people who um there's a lot of younger people who well, I mean, we have someone locally who is not going to be able to run again, um, someone who's contributed a lot because of finances and childcare and all that other stuff um, and housing. And I think if we really want broad representation around these tables, which I believe we all do, um, we need to we need to look at these things. It's not a lot of money. I've talked to many folks in other municipalities and local governments that have done this it has amounted to hardly anything, like even under $1,000 a year in some cases for childcare as an example. So it's the only way we're gonna to start to shift who we see around the table. Um, and that includes people of all ages, um, just having um, a spectrum there. So I don't have a problem with uh, supporting all of, all of these, thanks. Uh, Dr. McCall, go ahead. Yeah, this, sorry to go back to the extended health. I, I, could I just get clarity that the $20,000 a year is an additional cost to the organization and basically by changing the policy, whether or not we have uh, directors over the age of 70 participating in that extended, we're going to have that $20,000 additional cost going forward. Is that correct? Okay, thanks. Yeah, I think the goal of what we had asked for these amendments is, as uh, Director Moran said, diversity around the table. And um, a lot of other local governments are looking at these things as well. Um, I hope that if heaven forbid, I'm still at this table um, 25 years from now, <laughs> that, uh, that I don't feel the pressure of suddenly getting cut off from extended health, which would include prescriptions and eye care and um, dental and all sorts of things, right? That's pretty important stuff for people. And um, diversity does include all ages um, in, in my view. So I think that um, uh, I, I would support um, 
the extended health along with the other uh, benefits that we're talking about because uh, the cost is, is really minor um, on a regional scale and um, yet it does affect um, people's um, willingness to, to put their names forward um, for, for local government service um, quite, quite a lot. So thank you. Director Humira, go ahead. Hey, thanks. Um, I only... I, do, I only left out the extended health because I understood um, from Director Grieve that he thought that was it was the cost was abhorrent. So I'm happy to include it too. So <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> yeah. uh, Director McCall. I guess I, what my issue is with the extended health is it goes beyond what um, other people working in different aspects of our society are entitled to for extended health benefits. And we're going beyond um, what you could expect in um, a role as a teacher, um, a, an employee uh, working in a municipality, that it's pretty standard that extended benefits end at 70. So I don't think that we're limiting participation by not creating a benefit that doesn't exist in common business practice. And I think that's where my concern is that we're adding a cost that may or may not be used as a benefit. And it is, you know, I, I don't think that whether or not we extend this is really going to impact um, what we're setting out to do by looking at these things, which is um, inclusivity and diversity of the board. So I, I, I mean, I'm not, I don't know if I'd vote against it, but I just want to point out, point it out that there, there's not a lot of extended health plans that go that long, which is probably why the cost of it is $20,000, that it's unusual. Director Grief. I might also uh, clarify that by saying that uh, the two locations you mentioned have gold plated everything already, 100% dental, medical, stress leave. We're not talking about that. We're talking about half, meeting halfway. So. I, I plead on behalf of uh, Director Hillian, who's not here, and I invoke the spirits to. Uh... Anyway, yeah, I think it, you know. I think Kevin would agree that this is basically a rounding error in a budget. <laughs> and Director Cole Hamilton, go ahead. Yeah, thanks very much, Chair. Um, I a bit like Director Vimier had thought initially Director Grieve was saying he had no use for it. And and I assume probably Director Hillian, given his past career, probably has uh, good coverage. Um, in which yes. case in which case it seemed that it would probably be of, of no use whatsoever uh, currently. But uh, I, I do hear the case being made and, and I think in and um well, I see the point that Director McCollum is making. Um, you know, diversity to, includes age diversity, and older folks, including older women, tend to actually older women, I believe, have the highest rate of poverty in the country. So, if we want to um, encourage people like that to participate, then this is a benefit which could be of use. And it's not uh, anyway. I, 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 as I said, I think having heard. Uh, Director Grieve's full uh, opinions on the subject. Uh, I think meeting him halfway or uh, seems like a, a reasonable measure. So I'd be inclined to support that at this point. Thank you. And I don't see any further lights. So we're on receipt. Vote full board. All in favor of receipt. Any opposed? That's carried. And I guess if we want to move um, a recommendation that includes these amendments, is that? I'll move the recommendation to include the potential benefits. Any further discussion? Just, is, sorry, yes, just, so just for clarity then, is, is those benefits to include extended health, family care, parental compassionate leave, and transit? Yes. Yes. I, I didn't hear much support for the retirement savings plan. Just want to be clear. Yes, for all. No, no retirement savings. <laughs> well, I'm I'm willing I'm willing to uh, go with the uh, will of the board. Uh, retirement savings plan allowance is not gaining traction. Is that what I hear? Anybody for it? Make a motion. Okay, okay, I'll make. <laughs> Director Arbor's having a medical emergency. Hopefully not. 
Okay, then I'll move that. And with the clarification that the, the retirement savings plan allowance is not part of the package. Family care, very important. Retirement savings plan, not so much. So parental compassionate care is definitely important. Transit pass is a nice bonus, unless you live in area C. <laughs> Okay, so the uh, the motion is up on the screen. Yeah, I think it was. Yeah, first and second. The transit pass is going to get you to your extended health care. Okay, any further discussion? Are we there? Okay. To vote the full board, all in favor? Anyone opposed? Director Grant opposed? And um, I don't see a director Arbor, so we're not quite sure. Hopefully it's not actually a message. <laughs> um, we'll just have to accept his, his uh, vote as in favor. Because if he abstains, then it is a in favor vote. So, okay, so that passes. Moving on, we have Bylaws and resolutions for adoption, bylaw number 656, the rural Comox Valley zoning bylaw to do with Langua Road. Second. Hamir and Cole Hamilton, thank you. And it's a vote of the areas. Oh, and Director Arbor's back. And we, we voted on the last um, remuneration bylaw without you. <laughs> But we're now on to the um, adoption of bylaw 656. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously, thank you. And the next bylaw is 726, the Comox Valley Recreation Complex Fees and Charges bylaw. Second. Cole Hamilton and McCollum, thank you. And again, this is for adoption and it's a vote the full board. All in favor? Anyone opposed? And that's carried unanimously. Thank you. And we don't have an in camera today, so it's just termination. Second. McCollum and Cole Hamilton, all in favor? Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you, Madam Chair. Sure.